Today, a House Government Reform Subcommittee looked at the supply, demand, and cost of fuel. Witnesses included Assistant Energy Secretary Vicki Bailey, as well as the Acting Administrator of the Energy Information Agency and the Federal Trade Commission General Counsel. The hearing is just over two and a half hours. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to uh, today's meeting of the Energy Policy, Natural Resource and Regulatory Affairs Subcommittee of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. We have two panels today of witnesses. And the way we're going to proceed is that I'm going to make an opening statement. Any other members who are here by the time I finish are going to be allowed to enter an opening statement. To the extent they arrive after I'm finished and they have opening statements, we will enter them into the record. Each of the committee, each of the committee members is allowed to do that. Each of the witnesses has submitted a written testimony to the committee. We have reviewed that testimony on both panels of all witnesses. Each of the witnesses is going to be provided five minutes uh, to summarize their testimony, and then we will go to questions. If there are no other members here, we will just have question after question after question from me. If there are other members, we will rotate back and forth, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Today we find ourselves in a unique set of circumstances. Across the way in the other body, we find the Senate considering the uh, energy bill. And it's, uh, I'm glad to see that the other body is coordinating its schedule with ours. Over the last several weeks, gasoline prices have risen more than 25 cents per gallon, and that makes this an extremely timely issue. Recent years have seen dramatic price increases in gasoline during, during each spring as demand increases and refiners switch from winter to summer formulations to meet environmental regulations. The double combination has typically led to general increases in prices nationwide, as well as regional price spikes. Last June, this subcommittee held a similar hearing to today's as gasoline prices soared and consumers in some areas of the country were paying more than two bucks a gallon for regular unleaded gasoline. Although prices have yet to get that high this year, our gasoline markets still face all the challenges that they did a year ago. To paraphrase a former president from my home state of California, ladies and gentlemen, here we go again. Recent unrest in the Middle East and labor protests in Venezuela have increased uncertainty over the supply of crude oil. The cost of crude directly affects the cost of refined gasoline products. Imports account for 60% of our crude oil that we process. While the U.S. imports oil from a variety of countries, the bulk of the oil imports come from a small number of oil exporting countries. Interestingly, both Venezuela and Iraq are among the top five oil exporters to the United States. However, it isn't just the crude oil markets that are affecting the price of gasoline. Our own domestic refining industry is struggling to meet consumer demands as well as comply with an array of complex federal and state regulatory requirements. An example of such complexity was reported in the Wall Street Journal on April 4th of this year when the main terminal for Phillips Petroleum in Phoenix literally ran out of gas. It got so bad that several filling stations in the Phoenix area also ran out of gas. One of the problems plaguing the refining industry in recent years has been the balkanization of the gasoline market. Twenty years ago, the nation was essentially a single market for gasoline. Today, the nation's been cut up, balkanized, if you will, into dozens of tiny boutique markets with their own specialized blends of gasoline, all done pursuant to federal statute. As the Phoenix situation shows, when there's a supply problem, prices can go up, imagine that, or worse, areas can literally run out of gas. If these problems weren't enough, future gasoline markets may become even less stable as refiners deal with the effects of phasing out the fuel additive MTBE and replacing it with ethanol. Under the Clean Air Act, refiners selling gasoline in areas with severe air pollution are required, required by legislative mandate to add oxygenated fuel additives to the gasoline. Currently, two additives, MTBE and ethanol 
constitute nearly all of the oxygenates added to fuel. You'd think that those of us in Congress since 1990 would want to solve the problem that was created in the 1990 Clean Air Act. However, across the, across the building, in the other body, today the Senate is considering Senator Daschle's energy bill, S-517, which would only make the problem worse. Senator Daschle's bill would ban the use of MTB outright and replace it with a new national mandate requiring the use of 5 billion gallons of ethanol. Unfortunately, MTB does have serious environmental side effects, most notably the pollution of groundwater. We need to resolve these environmental challenges with science, not mandates. If you actually examine the record and the facts, you'll find most of the MTB pollution stems from leaky storage tanks and leaky transmission lines. The federal government should set the environmental goals that we want out of our automobiles. What is it that comes out of the tailpipe to achieve the clean air or the clean water, clean soil that we desire, and then allow science the flexibility to achieve these clean air goals or clean water goals as science finds acceptable, rather than by a legislative mandate. It's the only way to get to the most cost-effective, scientifically sound solution. The federal government should literally not be in the business of micromanaging what goes into our gas tanks. Senator Daschle's bill, unfortunately, will ensure that we face higher gasoline prices and less stable markets in the future. According to the Independent Energy Information Administration, which we're going to call the EIA from now on, the provisions of the Senate Energy Bill banning MTBE and requiring a renewable fuel standard will increase the average cost of reformulated gasoline by between 9 and 10 and a half cents per gallon. So everybody here, get ready. Next time you fill up, you're going to be paying between 9 and 10 and a half cents per gallon more due to Senator Daschle's ethanol requirement than you are today. EI estima EIA estimates that the provisions will result in higher annual costs to consumers nationwide of $6.37 billion a year. That's the low number, by the way, because there are other industry experts who predict the cost will be higher, approaching $8.4 billion a year. If either prediction is accurate, well, let's say, let's say if either prediction is halfway accurate, it's an expensive proposition. As the late Senator Everett Dirksen put it, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. In short, unstable crude, crude oil supply, tight refining capacity, a dazzling array of federal and state clean air requirements, and frankly, counterproductive currently being considered Senate legislation, all lead us to question whether or not our gasoline market is stable at any price. I want to welcome our witnesses today. I look forward to your testimony. I have, in fact, read it. Probably comes as a surprise, but I have read it. Uh, I want to welcome on our first panel the Acting Administrator for the Energy Information Administration, Ms. Mary Hunsler, and the Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs at the Department of Energy, Ms. Vicki Bailey and the General Counsel for the Federal Trade Commission, Mr. William Kovacic. Ladies, gentlemen, thank you for coming. Ms. Hustler, we're going to recognize Mr. Shays for the purpose of an opening statement. No opening statement, Mr. Chairman, but just really delighted you're having this hearing. It's very important. Delighted that you have the witnesses you have, and I'm happy to, um, uh, to be here. Thank you. We welcome the gentleman, as is the custom with this committee. We swear our witnesses in. We'll do it on the second panel, too, so you're not being, uh, you're not getting special treatment here. If you'd all rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the tr testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Ms. Hutzler, we're going to recognize you first for, for a period of five minutes to summarize your testimony. You're on. You need to turn that on. Push the button there. Okay. 
I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the current situation and the outlook for U.S. gasoline markets. The gasoline outlook depends on assumptions about certain key factors, including worldwide economic growth, the extents of OPEC supply restriction and non-OPEC supply response, and the implications of these factors for world oil balances and crude oil prices. Economic growth in the United States, while improving, is expected to be relatively modest this year, up a projected 1.6 percent, with more robust overall growth likely in 2003. Oil demand growth in the United States is expected to be minimal this year, while global demand is expected to begin recovering, rising 600,000 barrels per day. This level of demand, coupled with the cutbacks in production initiated by OPEC, which between December 2000 and today have amounted to approximately 4 million barrels per day, is expected to move industrialized country oil stocks toward the lower end of the average range later this year, as shown in this chart. This change in oil stocks is expected to result in rising crude oil prices in 2002 and into 2003. World oil prices rose on average by about $4 per barrel in March from February levels, as the U.S. benchmark West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil price rose to an average of $24.50 per barrel. West Texas intermediate prices are projected to rise to the high 20s per barrel by the end of 2002, even assuming that production from OPEC will increase from current levels. Uncertainty about overall world oil market conditions, rising tensions in the Middle East, and political turmoil in Venezuela push prices to levels above $27 per barrel briefly in early April. However, if OPEC does not increase production during the second half of this year, world oil markets could witness a repeat of 2000, when prices rose sharply during the second half of the year before large production increases eased price pressures. For the upcoming summer season, rising average crude oil costs are expected to yield above average seasonal gasoline price increases at the pump. However, pump prices are expected to range below last year's averages, assuming no unanticipated disruptions. Inventories are at higher levels than last year in April, providing a cushion against early season price spikes. Regular grade retail gasoline prices are expected to average $1.46 per gallon, 5 percent lower than last summer's average of $1.54 per gallon. However, based on the aggregate uncertainties involved in forecasting the world crude oil market and the domestic refining distribution system, prices could average 11 to 13 cents per gallon higher or lower than the baseline forecast during the upcoming driving season. The projected average summer gasoline price, when adjusted for inflation, is well below the record reached during the summer of 1980, about $2.65 per gallon in 2001 dollars. Gasoline demand is projected to average 8.88 million barrels per day, a new record, up 140,000 barrels per day, a 1.6 percent from last summer. The growth comes amid the gradual acceleration of the U.S. economy out of the 2001 economic slowdown. This summer's expected growth rate is almost double last year's rate of 0.9 percent. Motor gasoline stocks were about 17 million barrels above last year at the end of March. All Petroleum Administration for Defense Districts had higher levels of stocks than last year, and only the Midwest was slightly lower than the historical average as of the end of March. Total domestic gasoline output is projected to average 8.29 million barrels per day during the summer months, about 115,000 barrels per day above last summer. Higher U.S. output and the greater availability of product and storage at the outset of the season are expected to displace net imports of gasoline. Net imports are projected to be 560,000 barrels per day, down 100,000 barrels per day from those of last summer. It is important to note that we have always experienced spring gasoline price run-ups. However, they now are appearing more frequently with larger increases and in a compressed period of time. Part of the reason for the increased volatility can be traced to declining stock levels. Over the last 10 years, there has been a clear downward trend in the level of gasoline inventories. This trend is exacerbated when it is compared to demand levels that have been increasing. Thus, U U.S. gasoline inventory levels cover far fewer days of consumption than they did 10 years ago. With lower inventory levels, there is a reduced ability to quickly increase supply when demand increases unexpectedly or when supplies are impacted either by distribution problems or decreased refinery production. 
Spring price run-ups have also occurred following winters with tight distillate fuel markets, resulting in refiners maximizing distillate fuel production at the expense of gasoline. Also, refiners typically increase their refinery throughput in the spring as they increase gasoline production and build up inventories, resulting in increased demand for crude oil, which leads to pressure on crude oil markets. At times, this has coincided with decreases in crude oil production, leading to sharp crude oil price increases that eventually lead to higher gasoline prices. And Ms. More Hessler, recent you've uh, used your five minutes. Uh, appreciate your summary. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to summarize. Okay. Uh, I wanted to mention that there were two factors in addition to the that factor into the price run-ups. One is the transition from winter grade to summer grade gasoline. The other is the impact that gasoline price, that crude oil prices have on gasoline prices. They represent about 40 percent of the gasoline price, and therefore they're also a factor. I thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Hussler. Our next witness, again, is the Assistant Secretary Terry for Policy and International Affairs with the Department of Energy, Ms. V Vicki Bailey. Ms. Bailey, you are recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I am happy to appear before you today to discuss gasoline prices and the complex factors contributing to our current supply and price situation. I would also like to provide some information for your committee on what the administration is doing to address the situation and to assure you that the administration is eager to work with Congress to ensure stable and affordable energy supplies for American consumers and the U.S. economy. You have just heard testimony and uh, some technical analysis from Mary Huxler of the uh, EIA on gasoline prices, international markets, and domestic factors that impact gasoline prices. I would like to address some of the broader policy aspects of the international and domestic market. There are a number of factors affecting gasoline prices and supplies in the U.S. with both domestic and international routes. Number one is the price of crude oil on the world market. Global supply and demand dictate the crude oil price for every consuming nation. In the U.S., our economy is rebounding, demand for gasoline is increasing as we approach the summer driving season, and refiners are making the transition to winter, from winter to summer quality gasoline, helping to contribute to upward prices, uh, upward pressure on prices. Countering this trend, Product inventories are rising and refining production is increasing. The NEP was prepared to address our long-term energy needs. It presents a balanced approach to ensuring secure and affordable energy supplies to our citizens and our economy. It is comprehensive in addressing energy conservation, energy production, and environmental protection. The administration is actively involved in the international situation in many ways. We are working to diversify our foreign sources of energy, such as in the Caspian region and Azerbaijan. I attended the inauguration of the Caspian Pipeline Consortium Pipeline uh, that took place in Russia last November. This new pipe will bring crude oil directly from the landlocked Kazakhstan to the Black Sea and then to world oil markets. We also are pleased that the Baiku the Tbilisi Chehan pipeline is moving ahead to supply an additional 1 million barrels per day of oil to global markets by early 20, uh, 2005. We are increasing cooperation in our hemisphere through the North American Energy Working Group with Canada and Mexico, which is reviewing ways to further integrate uh, the North American energy market. The Secretary of Energy, with his Canadian counterpart, will lead the dialogue at the G8 Energy Ministers meeting in Detroit next month. A number of domestic actions are following the recommendations of the national energy policy. The Clean Air Act's new source review program is being reviewed in an interagency process with considerable public comment. The review will be completed in the near future. President Bush has directed us to fill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to its full capacity of 700 million barrels, and we have begun to do so. Since January, we have added 11.4 million barrels of oil. As we did last year, the department has set up a 24-hour gasoline hotline for consumers, a 1-800 number for consumers concerned about gasoline prices. In addition, the Secretary of Energy has asked EIA to publish a daily energy situation analysis report to monitor world events that could disrupt supplies. And DOE will continue to collect data and monitor the gasoline market. We will also need additional actions to assure adequate and dependable energy supplies at affordable prices and use energy more wisely. 
We need to improve efficiency and develop new transportation technologies. The National Energy Policy aims to optimize energy efficiency and conservation to effectively manage and extend the use of our energy resources, while also enhancing our standard of living and advancing our environmental objectives. The Department is working to implement our long-term vision of both a dramatic reduction in our dependence on petroleum and a dramatic reduction of vehicle emissions through the development and deployment of hydrogen fuel cells in the Freedom Car program. The administration supports significant tax incentives to reduce the price of highly efficient electric and gas electric hybrid vehicles now coming to market. We support increased use of biofuels. We need increased domestic energy production, including environmentally sensitive production, using the best available technology in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And finally, I'd like to address MTBE. The MTBE issue creates a challenge for public policy. The inherent need to balance energy supply and price concerns with resolution of environmental concerns for air quality and water quality. MTBE has played a significant role in improving air quality in areas impacted by transportation emissions and provides important quality and volume benefits for our gasoline supply. However, detection of MTB in our water supply has raised public concerns. To limit the risk of future price spikes, we must provide certainty to the market and industry to make the investments needed to continue to provide us with sufficient quantities of clean product to power the U.S. economy. The Department of Energy remains concerned about our current and longer-term energy supply situation. While we fully support the various clean fuel requirements that are necessary to protect our environment, we believe that it is important that any government action be implemented in a way that provides the regulatory certainty to encourage the necessary investments to protect our citizens from price spikes. We are eager to work with Congress to get our nation's energy house in order so that we have adequate, clean, safe supplies of petroleum at reasonable cost to consumers. This concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I would be glad to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Our third witness on the first panel is the General Counsel for the, I have to say this slowly, the General Counsel for the Federal Trade Commission, Mr. William Kovacic. Thank you for joining us. I recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am grateful to the committee for the opportunity to appear at today's hearing. The written statement I have submitted represents the views of the Federal Trade Commission, and my comments today and my answers to your questions are my views and not necessarily those of the Commission or its members. The FTC's experience in enforcing the nation's antitrust laws and performing competition policy research confirms this committee's view that the performance of the petroleum industry is a matter of special importance in our economy. Since Congress created the FTC in 1914, no sector has commanded greater attention from the Commission. Today I will summarize three points from the Commission's written statement. First, I will describe the FTC's recent competition policy activities involving the petroleum industry. Second, I will review forces that our work to date has identified as factors that may affect the price of petroleum products. And finally, I will address future measures that the FTC intends to take to increase our understanding of pricing patterns, to preserve competition, and to protect consumers of petroleum products. Let me begin with recent FTC activities concerning competition policy in this sector. The Commission's work in recent years falls into three categories, reviewing mergers, non-merger investigations, and research. Perhaps the most prominent of these initiatives is merger review. The Commission scrutinizes mergers to challenge transactions that appear likely to reduce competition. Two recent matters are illustrative. The first is the merger of Chevron and Texaco. In December 2001, the FTC agreed to a consent order with these companies requiring numerous divestiture of refining transportation and retailing assets to maintain competition in various areas of the country, particularly in the southern and western United States. The second transaction is the merger of Valero Energy and Ultramar Diamond Shamrock. These firms are leading refiners and marketers of carb gasoline. In February of this year, the FTC accepted a consent order requiring Valero to divest assets in California, including an Ultramar refinery in Avon and retailing assets in Northern California. 
Our second major area of recent activity consists of investigations into possible non-merger antitrust violations. A major example was our inquiry into pricing behavior in the Midwestern United States in the summer of 2000. This inquiry did not identify evidence of collusion or other antitrust violations. Nonetheless, the investigation did increase the Commission's understanding of phenomena that cause periodic price increases. The third activity is research. One major example of our work in this area took place last August when the FTC held a one-day conference on gasoline pricing patterns. The conference stimulated an informative discussion of possible causes of pricing volatility in this sector. Let me turn to some preliminary lessons from the Commission's work about factors that influence prices. Taken together, our work has improved our understanding of what causes periodic dramatic price increases. We have learned that pricing spikes result from a complex interaction of phenomena. Noteworthy factors include the following. Increases in crude oil prices, refinery production problems such as breakdowns, pipeline disruptions, low inventories, and the unavailability of substitutes for certain gasoline formulations required by environmental statutes and regulations. In many respects, this list mirrors the factors that this committee's hearings of roughly a year ago identified. Let me finish by turning to what we see as next steps for the Commission in this field. The first element of our work will be to continue our scrutiny of structural developments that influence the number of market participants, especially mergers. The second will be to sustain our efforts to increase understanding of the causes of pricing behavior in this sector. On May 8th and 9th, we will hold a second public conference that extends the work we did in August with a further examination of petroleum pricing patterns. And third, we are monitoring wholesale and retail prices of gasoline in many areas of the United States. This project will assist us in identifying unusual pricing patterns, diagnosing causes, and devising cures for any antitrust problems we observe. To sum up, Energy sector and petroleum industry practices have been the centerpiece of modern FTC enforcement experience. There is every reason to expect they will remain a central focus of our work in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kavasi. Uh, we're going to go five-minute rounds here. I'm going to start, then we're going to go to Mr. Waxman, then back to Mr. Shays until we exhaust the questions that the members have. Ms. Hutzler, in your testimony, you have an extensive discussion about the effect of the Senate's ethanol mandate, that the Senate's ethanol mandate would have on gasoline prices. And there is a, uh, frankly, a laundry list of assumptions and reference cases and provisos and caveats and all that, and I'm sure that all makes sense to economists. But frankly, when you, when you talk about reference cases and I talk about reference cases, there's a divergence. I talk about the reference case of what is it, what does it cost me to go into the gasoline station today and fill my tank? Compared, I want, in that context, I want to ask you this specific question. Compared to today, what effect would the ethanol requirement in Senator Daschle's bill have on gasoline prices? We looked at a number of different scenarios and there is a scenario that looks at an MTBE ban with a renewable fuel standard. If we take a look at that scenario, in 1766, where we looked at a 100% ban, that is no MTBE, we found that reformulated gasoline prices could be nine to 10 and a half cents higher than today where there is no MTBE ban. That would make average prices about four cents a gallon higher. Uh, if you looked at 517, which is the latest request that we got from Senators Daschle and Murkowski to analyze, that allows waivers within states. And if states chose their waivers so that they could still produce about 13% of MTBE in their gasoline, which was what we were asked to analyze, we would see RFG prices seven and a half to eight cents higher a gallon than today, and average prices about three cents per gallon higher. Now, if you did not look at an MTBE ban, but you had a renewable, for, 
renewable fuel standard, we find that prices would increase far less, less than one cent per gallon for RFG and less than a half a cent per gallon for average gasoline. So if you, if you left the decision as to how to meet the emission issue to science <clears throat> and the renewable fuel standard, you'd have roughly a one cent increase in the price at the retail pump versus well, a three or up to 10 cent increase with the ethanol mandate. Mm. Under two case, to the two cases you've cited. Well, the cases deal with whether you're banning MTBE and must use other products to blend your gasoline. Uh, mostly, that would be ethanol today, or whether you're looking at a renewable fuel standard. A renewable fuel standard by itself, without banning MTBE, gives refiners flexibility to use the renewable fuels in all forms of gasoline, not just to ban. MTBE and to use it in RFG. And that translates to a one cent increase? Right. Okay. So. For reformulated gasoline. Mr. Kovacic, in your testimony, you talk about concentration in the refining industry, and frankly, we all are concerned about that. And it's my understanding that there's actually an index that somebody has cooked up. Uh, to calculate how concentrated any industry is. And it's called, and if I get this wrong, I need to be corrected, Hirsch, the Hirschman Herfindahl Index? That's it exactly. Right. Does the FTC have guidelines for how much scrutiny an industry receives based on how concentrated it is per the Hirschman Herfindahl Index? The Federal Trade Commission and the Department the FTC and the Department of Justice have merger guidelines that rely on that index as one factor for evaluating the competitive effects of mergers. It's my understanding that an index reading of less than a thousand means that FTC's concerns are frankly non existent, that a reading between a thousand and eighteen hundred means that FTC will at least look at it, but other factors must be considered. And then a reading over 1,800, FTC is going to apply a careful scrutiny. That's a good summary. Okay. Now, how concentrated is the refining industry today? Basically, when we examine refining industry concentration, we do that on a geographic basis. The amount of concentration typically varies from geographic area to geographic area. So the the answer would depend crucially on what part of the country we're examining. Well, let's look at uh, the Petroleum Defense District 1, 2, and 3. According to my records, the index has a reading of 586 for those three pads. I'm not certain what the the precise numbers are. I know that in several of our principal merger reviews in, in those areas, we have, we have seen in examining specific transactions uh, levels of concentration well above the 1800 level, which defines the zone of our most serious concern. But the nationwide average, you're talking about a regional market. Precisely, and many of the, many of the Mergers we've looked at have involved reg uh, markets that, for antitrust purposes, are genuinely regional rather than uh, nationwide. All right. My time has expired. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from California, the ranking member on the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for thank, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for holding this uh, hearing. I uh, commend you for your opening statement and your concerns about the fact that our own domestic refining industry is struggling to meet consumer demands as well as comply with an array of complex federal and state regulatory requirements, that we have balkanization of fuels, and that we have uh, uh, possible shortages and higher prices as a result of the uh, 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 effect of trying to deal with this MTBE replacement. Is it the position of the administration that you support the Daschle bill that's being considered in the Senate? I think your, direct, your question is directed at Ms. Bailey. Yeah. Uh, All right. You're, you're representing the administration here? Yes. Um, 
Yes, now you can hear me. Um, our position... Ye yes or no, because I wanted to say some other things in the time I have. If, if, it's, if the answer is yes, say yes. If it's not, say no. We support the uh, 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 reformulated fuels package that is in uh, uh, the bill. And Senator Daschle's bill. Well, let me say that I agree with the chairman uh, that we should have solved this problem in a very different way. And it seems to me that last year the Bush administration made a decision which was going to cost Californians dearly. Faced with over 10,000 MTBE contaminated sites in California, Governor Davis decided in 1999 to phase out the use of this terribly polluting fuel additive. And to facilitate this phase out, the state of California requested a waiver of the federal oxygenate requirements for reformulated gasoline. This waiver would have allowed the state to maintain the cleanest fuel standards in the country while shielding California consumers from gasoline price shocks. And without the waiver, California's air quality and economy would suffer as massive amounts of ethanol were needlessly imported to comply with the oxygenate requirements. Now, EPA's technical staff examined the facts, and they found that a waiver was warranted. And unfortunately, the White House reversed EPA's decision after meeting with special interests. As a result of the Bush administration's decision, the governor has had to delay the ban on MTBE to avoid dramatic price increases at the pump. This means California groundwater will continue to face the threat of contamination, and California consumers and refiners will continue to face massive uncertainties. The President's decision is truly remarkable because it appears to be bad for consumers, bad for the environment, and bad for California's refining industry. So who benefits from this decision? Well, it's been widely reported that the ethanol industry lobbied against the California waiver. And I know the ethanol industry is very much with the administration and Senator Daschle in the bill that's now pending. Other special interests may have played a role in the administration's decision. Lobbying disclosure documents and press reports provide evidence that companies involved in the MTBE industry, such as Enron, also lobbied against the California waiver. Enron and other MTBE companies took the cynical approach that without the California waiver, California would have to delay their MTBE ban. And sadly, they've turned out to be right. To better understand the extent to which Enron or other companies in the MTBE industry influence the decision, I'm, I've written to uh, Vice President Cheney, the Department of Energy, the US EPA, and OMB Director Mitch Daniels. And I'm going to ask uh, unanimous consent that my letters be uh, attached to my uh, statement today. Part Without of the record. objection. I expect a considerable discussion in this hearing today, and from, especially for the next panel, regarding the legislation the Senate has designed to ban, the, ban FTBE and replace it with a renewable fuels standard. I, I'm hoping we'll hear from others uh, in, in this hearing um, on this legislation. We should be taking a thoughtful approach to this legislation to ensure that we don't create new problems in trying to solve existing ones. Ultimately, decisions about our fuel supply need to be made based on the best science. And I noted, Mr. Chairman, you made that point very, very clear in your opening statement. Our goal should be clear, minimize air pollution, reduce dependence on foreign oil, and keep costs down. Good science can help us achieve these goals. What the California delegation did on a bipartisan basis was urge that we not have an ethanol requirement, an oxygenated requirement, an MTBE requirement, that we be allowed to have a reformulated gasoline that would achieve the environmental goals. And if we'd be allowed to do that, uh, we wouldn't have to be worried about the price hikes in gasoline and the shortages that we may face and all the other pollution problems and contamination problems uh, resulting from the extended use of MTBE longer than it should be permitted. So I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and giving everyone an opportunity to air uh, this issue out, issue because I think it's an important one. I thank the gentleman. Gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you, Chairman. Again, thank you for holding these hearings. I. Um I, uh, representing part of the, the Northeast, we, we see a very volatile um, flow, cost of, 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 of gasoline. And it, in my own mind, is based on the 
uh, points made in the second to last paragraph of the of our chairman, the unstable crude oil supply, tight refining capacity, a dizzying, uh, dizzying array of, of federal and state clean air requirements um, in particular. I, I wanted to ask, um, but the one thing that happens is we still have the supply. Uh, the price changes, but, but, but we have a supply. People don't have a shortage of supply. Um, in the sense that they get, when they go, they can get what they need, but it costs more at certain times of the year. What I'm interested in understanding is, it's my understanding, and I want to be corrected if it's not true, that we have different blends, obviously, during different times of the year. Is that correct? Nodding of heads doesn't uh, get recorded. Yes, it's correct. Yeah. Um, and th what I then want to understand is, I have been told that we, they have to, when we go from one blend to another, we actually have to have the tanks empty out before we start the new blend. And it seems to me that that just encourages a, a shortage of supply. And I wonder why we don't allow it to be a blend on a blend. In other words, they put in the new mixture and all to, over time, the new mixture becomes the dominant mixture. Why isn't that allowed? Um. I mean, in other words, mm. I don't understand. Maybe I'm inaccurate, and maybe someone else can answer this question. But, okay. but I don't understand why we make a, we empty a tank because it just guarantees that you're going to have shortages. You 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 have to use it all up. Why can't you just start to add the new blend? The, well, the problem with blending the two together is that you would no longer meet the requirement. So there are specific requirements. But, but that is there something magical the at a certain point, at a certain date, that says you have to go from one absolute blend to another? Why can't it become a graduation, a graduated change from one blend to another? I don't understand it. Um, if I if I can possibly jump in here for a little bit, um, <clears throat> waiting to an area that I'm I'm not that familiar with from my own personal background, but from the the understanding that these these blends, these transitions happen winter to summer, uh, I think from the standpoint of the transition period happens sometime between mid-April through about the, the end of June, and then of course you have that blend through the summer. Now, these different blends are, are state region required, uh, and I think they, they I know, have... They may be required, but does it make sense? From from my reading and, and what I know, it seems to make sense to that locale and that region and according to EPA requirements. Ma'am, uh, I, I understand the requirements. We're, we're trying to, excuse me, I mean, Ms. Bailey, I'm sorry. It's okay. Ms. Bailey, I, I understand, I think I understand the requirements. What I don't understand is why we haven't tried to find a way to address it. There's nothing magical about a particular date uh, that all of a sudden you go from one blend to another. And all I'm asking is, and if you don't have the expertise to answer or don't know the answer, that's another issue. I just need to understand why there's something magical about one blend from another and why we have to empty one. If you told me that one blend counteracts the other and it creates some incredible cocktail that we don't want, mm -hmm. that's another issue. Um, if that's I, the issue, then that would be the answer. But that would be the only answer that would justify it. Uh, I was trying to uh, share the, the knowledge that I did have, but I understand that the blends, are, of course, have to do with the needs of the region as well as the volatility of the fuel, uh, considering it's summer versus, versus winter. How many different blends do we have? I think at one point there may have been like 15 or so, possibly. 15 different, so that means you have to have 15 different uh, tanks uh, devoted to that I don't know that that means you have to have different tanks. I think the issue is the refineries, the, the, the capacity of the refineries, where the refineries are located. Uh, I'm from the Midwest. I know their use of ethanol because of the uh, abundance of corn, uh, that kind of thing, and the refineries in that region are able to produce the needed blends. If this blend has to come, the, the blend stocks have to come from uh, the Gulf of Mexico, Gulf Coast area, uh, and it has to go to California, obviously there are other costs and, and premiums required because of that. Gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for being with us today. Um, I certainly don't profess to be an expert on this, so I hope you'll bear with me uh, a little bit. Just looking at this whole idea about additives, uh, would you all agree that, that it appears at least uh, that additives do cause groundwater and drinking water to be unsafe uh, to a certain degree, particularly the NTBE? Is there agreement generally about that? There's I guess that's what the, the science has found, that there has been, I guess, from, from leakage that there has been some and Problem. nobody's generally contesting that. There's nobody claiming that that's not the case. Am I right? I haven't done any work in the area. I, I'm certainly aware of the work, especially that the committee did a year ago, where there was extensive testimony on the point. Um, from my information, I, I just know that detection uh, of MTBE in our water supply has raised public concern. So okay. I'm well, I guess I raise that because I. I look at the provision in the Senate language that would provide a shield for the oil industry from liability uh, for producing any gasoline that poses a threat to clean uh, water or safe drinking water. And it doesn't make sense to me that if we have a very limited number of additives that we can use and some people are eliminating one of those additives, uh, that now we're telling people that they can uh, produce another additive or whatever that pollutes or, uh, or poses a threat and they won't be held responsible or accountable for it if they do. What does that do in terms of uh, basically giving people no incentive at all uh, to produce any kind of an additive that will in fact uh, be uh, good or beneficial, and certainly at least not harmful to our clean water and our safe drinking water? If I may answer, Please, again, yeah. I'm not sure who you're directing that. Anybody, directed because to, it just doesn't make any sense um, to me. I'm wondering if somebody can okay. lend uh, something um, as I have said uh, in, in my comments and in my statement, the MTB issue creates a, a challenge for public policy. Um, uh, the inherent need to balance the energy supply, price concerns, as you've mentioned, the resolution of environmental concerns uh, that, that EPA is concerned about, uh, air quality, water quality in the different uh, locations. Um, all we have to go on is our, is our analysis. We have recent EIA analysis that shows that uh, the restriction on the use of MBT could impact gasoline supply and, and increase prices. Um, so what I, I, the administration is hoping to do is try and balance those issues and come to, with, forward with a solution. Um, we are aware that there are states, California I know, has, is going to ban the, the use of MTBE, I believe, uh, uh, in 2004. There are other um, timelines uh, for, for other phasing out of MTBE through state actions. Um, I guess, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, we have limited time. What's the policy basis behind saying that if you get rid of MTBE, uh, whatever else you use, no matter how bad it is, you won't be held liable? I mean, what's the administration's position on that? And explain to me how that makes any sense at all, how there would be a provision that allows the oil industry to just walk away from liability that does not encourage them, in fact, uh, to have some substitute that, in fact, it protects or at least doesn't uh, injure. From what I know, I know the, the balance in, in, in the bill and the language in the bill and, and our support uh, for the use of ethanol, our support for uh, uh, the oxygenates that, that need the, the different blends. Um, obviously, we have to take into concerns the issues of the industry um, and not being a part of that negotiation uh, per se. I'm not quite aware of all the particulars of, of, the, of, of the issue, but from the standpoint we're trying to balance the needs of uh, energy security, trying to balance the environment, trying to balance well, that along with the economy. Explain to me any balance at all. If you know we're the government, we're supposed to be protecting citizens. Explain to me any balance where it works to allow the industry to walk away from liability uh, when they produce something that's harmful to our drinking and our, and our water supply. I, I, once again, not knowing all the particulars, I, I would recognize surely that EPA is also has uh, various restrictions and detections there, uh, which I'm sure they cannot walk away from. I'm not once again, uh, cognizant of all the particulars of the negotiation. All right, well, uh, your answer isn't, isn't really satisfactory, but I'm not sure whether that's because... Well, I'll be you know, glad you, to get back with you with, with further information. Would you? I mean, sure. I, my question is that I'd like some response in writing, if, if we were holding these things open. What is the administration's policy argument behind having, supporting a provision that would shield the oil industry from liability when they produce a gasoline that poses a threat to clean water or our safe drinking water? And that would be the question. I'd love to have an answer on that. I, I really don't think there is one, but I'm more than willing to listen. Thank I you. I will get back with you.
gentleman yields back mr kovacic i want to go back to this issue on the concentration of refining industry i have in front of me an analysis by charles river so charles river associates who is mr montgomery on the second panel works for that indicates that the concentration in the east that would be the petroleum administration defense department district district thank you one two and three has a rating of 586 keeping in mind the Hirschman herpendahl index ratings that the petroleum administration defense district four and five has a rating of 955 and that the u.s total the average on a nationwide basis is 532 now i don't know if you've seen that or not my question is that you've done an investigation on the west coast having to do with all the factors that the ftc consider considers in determining whether something is concentrated or not uh, what was your determination as it relates to pad five as to whether or not it was or was not concentrated uh, to use the Valero transaction as, as an example of how regional circumstances can be very important. In the California market, uh, Valero and, and Diamond Shamrock were two of the leading producers of gasoline blends that are acceptable by CARB standards in, in, in California. Uh, if, if we focused on the competitive effect of that transaction, we found that allowing the merger would pose a serious danger unless cures were imposed uh, for, for the production of, of carb ga gasoline for the California market. Uh, that's an instance in which the HHI index would have been well above the, the threshold of concern that, uh, that confronted us. It's one example of, of, of an instance in which the broader brush that I suspect the CRA study is taking would not have picked up a significant competitive pr uh, problem uh, within California itself. However, you condition that merger accordingly and force the liquidation of certain assets. Precisely. And in the end, the index rating after the fact, so to speak, determined by FTC was acceptable? Yes. That's right. And in fact, in, in, in all of the major transactions we have examined involving the West Coast market, and in many respects, we've used a, a West Coast analysis or a California analysis. Uh, we've, in fact, uh, required divestitures to create competitive conditions that we felt would be acceptable. Now, when you talk about competitive conditions, are you talking about ratings if a thousand, I mean, the HHI index, the standard is a, th a rating of a thousand or less the industry is unconcentrated, requiring no competitive review. An HHI index reading of between 1,000 and 1,800 indicates an industry moder moderately concentrated and that other factors must be considered. And an HHI index greater than 1,800 indicates an industry that's highly concentrated and needs careful scrutiny for any mergers. In your analysis, you said that after the conditions were placed on, you found that the uh, concentration was at an acceptable level. Does that mean 500 under the index, 800, 999? I mean, where, where did you find it? I, I think the, the, the crucial point that, that you mentioned earlier is that the, the numerical thresholds are a starting point. And we consider qualitative factors that bear upon the likelihood that a single firm will be able to raise prices acting by itself or a collection of firms acting at arm's length or collusively would be able to raise, raise prices. Uh, as a consequence, we tend not to, to look at a specific numerical threshold as being the decisive criteria. We examine other qualitative factors that would bear upon the acceptability of a specific transaction as well. In the West Coast analysis, were there other qualitative? I mean, we're going to examine this until you tell me whether we were real close, down around 500, 800. Where were we? Were there qualitative factors in the West Coast analysis that were required because the HHI index reading was above 1,000? Uh, some, some of the relevant uh, factors included the, 
possibility that there would that there would be given the nature of rivalry among firms whether there would be continued competition uh, among them another factor is the the possibility that shipments from outside the area would exercise a constraining influence on the on these the were, firms these were precursor considerations before that's the correct fact. that's correct and after the fact by virtue of the conditions you placed on there you were able to remove the quantitative analysis below the thousand threshold uh, the the we have in a number of instances uh, permitted mergers that had a a post divestiture or post -rem remedy uh, uh, HHI above a thousand or even above 1800 um, so that so that our aim is not always to push the post remedy HHI below a specific threshold say below 1800 or below a thousand it's to take account of the quality of competition in the market so that we are assured that, that the number of firms remaining and the quality of the firms will ensure a, a robust competitive interaction. That there won't be any reduction in the level of competition beyond that that existed when the, before the fact. At the end of the day, relative to PAD 1, you found the industry to not be overly concentrated. That's, that's correct, with the solutions. Market conditions were satisfactory. That's correct, right. with the solutions we imposed. All right, my time has expired. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts. And he and I may well have a little conversation here privately. I thank the gentleman. Same question on the East Coast. You did an investigation on the East Coast to determine whether or not the refining industry was concentrated to the detriment of the marketplace. What did you find there? Uh, when we examined transactions such as Exxon's acquisition of Mobile several years ago, um, uh, there the focus of attention was uh, we, were, we were convinced that the refining sector as such, the refining features of the transaction didn't pose a problem on the, on the East Coast. Uh, there, the concern to us was retailing and distribution. And in that instance, the focus of the solution on the East Coast was a massive divestiture of retailing assets, terminaling assets, but not refineries. So you found a way to sustain a competitive marketplace with a qualitative adjustment to whatever assets were held after the fact by the parties to the transaction. That's correct, principally by insisting upon retailing and distribution divestitures that placed selected retail stations and terminals in the hands of a company that would be a robust, robust alternative to the merging parties. So it's the opinion of the FTC as it relates to the PAD 1 and PAD 5, that it would be the literal regions of the country on the east and the west coast, that the refining industry is not overly concentrated. I, I would say that uh, in, in subject, subject to to solutions that we would impose in, in individual transactions. Um, we have not permitted a merger to go forward without solutions that we felt brought things to a level that would ensure an adequate level of rivalry. Okay, the reason I ask that question is I have the same series of questions as they relate to the ethanol industry. And if you recall the Charles River Associates reports, according to the information I have, for pads one, two, and three, the HHI index averaged 586. In the West Coast, for pad four and five, the HHI index was 955. The U.S. total, the index was 532. Same index, according to the GAO, the U.S. ethanol industry's rating under, under Hirschman Herfindahl is 1866 indicating a highly concentrated industry that needs careful scrutiny according to the standards that are uh, in the index itself. So I would ask you, how concentrated is the ethanol industry? Are these numbers accurate? I, I've seen the GAO study and I've looked at their, their conclusions. I, I would be interested to know the data on which they built up the conclusions, but Let's assume that it's a, uh, that, that they've defined what we would call a sensible relevant market. And let's assume for purposes of discussion that, that it's an airtight analysis. Um, certainly if we were thinking about future mergers, applying our standards, 
uh, and HHI at or above 1800 is where we would begin asking very serious questions. So you'd have a red flag waving in the air saying, Federal Trade Commission, look at this by virtue of this number. We would say that uh, once we've crept into that zone of concentration, that in looking at future transactions, these are the transactions where we would have the greatest concern and we would be focusing very carefully on qualitative factors that would either reinforce a tentative conclusion we draw from the numbers or disprove them. All right. This, this particular 1866 rating is for the U.S. industry as a whole. Yes. In terms of a regional situation in California, how concentrated, or for instance in my friend's state, Massachusetts, how concentrated is the ethanol industry? We don't uh, have a sense of that right now, Mr. Chairman, and I, I don't recall that the GAO study tried to break things out on a regional level, but if we were to examine this sector in more detail, that would be precisely the type of question we'd ask, which is for refineries that consumed ethanol or were required to use ethanol, what supply sources could they draw from, how broad a geographic area, in short, who could supply them. So we would do that kind of analysis on a region-by-region region basis. Who is the largest supplier of ethanol in the United States? ADM. ADM, Archer Daniels Midland? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Has ADM ever been fined or prosecuted for conspiring with competitors to fix prices? Uh, the Department of Justice uh, prosecuted ADM in the mid-1990s for fixing prices involving the food additive sector. Food additives used lysine. lysine for the production of animal feed and in some instances for, for, uh, for human food supplements as well. Now, the FTC has, as you say, has done several investigations of collusion or price gouging in the refining industry, separate and apart from the investigation in the food industry. Does the FTC take into consideration how concentrated the industry is in terms of conducting those investigations? It's an important variable for us. Uh, the reason for that is that the basic uh, economic literature suggests that putting all other factors aside, it's relatively easier for firms to reach agreement, consensus among them on a course of action, the smaller the number of industry participants. In terms of conducting these investigations, what sort of behavior do you look for? We look, first of all, for a similarity in, in behavior, but we also look for a similarity in behavior when we're focusing on collusion. A similarity of behavior that could only be explained if all of the industry participants agreed to take a given course of action. That is, a, a similarity of behavior, a course of behavior that might be commercial suicide for one firm acting alone, but might make a great deal of sense if everyone joined in the, in the conduct in question. Okay, thank you for that. My time is way overdue, and I didn't see Mr. Shays over there. I was so focused on you. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from Connecticut. The, the one thing I don't want to do is um, blame somebody for the price increases. I, I do believe it's an issue of supply and demand. I believe it's the issue of, of, of costs, uh, of crude, but obviously refining capacity and so on. But, but I am interested to hear... Uh, our panel, uh, each of you, uh, explain to me why the prices seem to jump so quickly, but uh, then when there's a, a significant drop in crude and so on, you still see the prices seem to s go down more slowly. Why does the spike s always seem to be uh, quite significant and sudden, and then the reduction takes so long? In actuality, we believe that, that uh, the, on the retail price side, the asymmetry you're talking about may actually be more of a consumer perception than reality. We've done a study called Price Changes in the Gasoline Market that tries to track the wholesale costs versus the retail prices. And in fact, they do track fairly closely. The issue is that there's a lag from the time that the wholesale price reaches the retail price and that lag gives this 
asymmetry that the public perceives, but in fact, they do track fairly closely. And so, it would have, let me ask you, Ms. Bailey, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, aside from um, uh, what Mary has said, um, aside from taxes, um, the other factors that contribute to to the differences in, in prices at, at different time, obviously, is proximity of supply uh, as, as to the areas furthest from the Gulf Coast, as I was uh, discussing earlier. Um, any kind of uh, supply disruption, any unplanned refinery outage, outages, that kind of thing. Um, competition in the local market, uh, the local area where... Um, so, uh, the question, though, was why does price seem to, <coughs> excuse me, jump so quickly and then uh, gradually uh, decline? And, and uh, the response was basically that it seems to track the price of, of crude oil uh, and so what you're saying is the crude oil goes up quickly and then uh, then seems to fall more uh, more gradually? Is the, uh, the price of crude oil is a very huge component of gasoline prices, but uh, in addition to that, the other issues of state taxes and other issues as it relates to refineries and other components of what goes into the gasoline prices, uh, operating costs and all those were the issues that, that I was raising. But um, crude oil prices, obviously, any, any change in that affects the, the price of the gasoline, uh, possibly as well. Do you have anything to add? Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, if I can um, offer a coming attraction, one of the focal points of our conference on May 8th and May 9th at the FTC will be precisely this issue. We've asked uh, several academics to examine whether the perception that you man mentioned is borne out by actual practice. And when uh, is that going to be? Uh, May 8th and May 9th uh, at our headquarters in Washington. Okay. Uh, we're going to be looking at gasoline prices. And several of the papers we've, we've asked to be presented will examine precisely this question. I, I, I'm not certain what the researchers will find. I, I have the impression that some of them are, are perhaps going to take issue about whether the perception is borne out by actual practice. Uh, but, but within a few weeks, uh, we hope to have a fuller perspective about uh, precisely that question from some who've studied actual patterns in detail. Thank you. Last year, we, uh, we wrote a letter requesting that the uh, Department of Energy um, review the accusations of price manipulations. What was the outcome of that? Is that something that you're familiar with? The request that was done, wasn't it? Well, now, um, I'm not sure when you requested that, that last year, but I was in the Midwest myself last year. I joined the administration in August of last year, and that, I'm not sure if that was during the time of your, your request for the report. How much of the price increase is, uh, when, again, using Ms. Rossi's statement, the unstable uh, crude oil supply and tighter refinery capacity and uh, and also the, the challenge of meeting the array of different requirements. If you broke up the, the cost component increase, how much is due to each part of that? Crude oil price, tighter capacity in the Northeast, tight capacity in the United States, but in the Northeast, and, and the, the various clean air requirements. When you break down that cost, how does it break down? Um. I have it decomposed slightly differently. In terms okay. of the price of gasoline, 40% is generally from the crude oil price. Okay. About 35% is from taxes. About when you say it's taxes, okay. Yeah, federal, state, local taxes, right. all of them. Uh, about 6% is from distribution and marketing, and about 19% is from refinery costs. And that, that also includes the environmental portion. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to, thank you. Um, my time has run up, sorry. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Kovacic, let me go back for a minute. Uh, you told me the largest supplier of ethanol in the United States is ADM. Yes, sir. Do you have any feel for what the percentage of the overall market is that they possess? Um, I believe, and I'd be glad to check on this, but I believe it's 40% plus. Now, I just asked you in terms of conducting these investigations into uh, collusion or price gouging, what sort of behavior do, do you, does the FTC look for? And you, you responded, 
what kinds of evidence or documents does FTC look for in trying to determine if an industry is colluding? Uh, the two types of evidence, uh, one is, one would consist of company records that on their own face actually bear out the fact of coordination or discussions with competitors. If we don't have that kind of evidence, uh, we then tend to look at what we can observe from outside the company. And most interesting to us is a pattern of parallel behavior that can be explained only if, or principally if, there is an agreement where it would be irrational for the firms to act in a given way unless they were absolutely confident that their rivals were going to do the same. This involves looking at pricing patterns. We look at, we look at input costs. Uh, for example, if a, if a firm's uh, input costs dropped dramatically but all the firms in the sector decided to increase prices, that could be provocative. The clerk is going to hand you a binder containing some documents. The first is document number one, titled the Western Ethanol Memo on BP Bids, which I presume means British Pol Petroleum. This document is a memo written by a Mr. Vin from Western Ethanol, which is a California-based ethanol distributor for LACA, which is a Costa Rican ethanol supplier which imports ethanol tariff-free under the Caribbean Basin Initiative. The subject of the memo is an auction to sell ethanol to BP in Seattle. I'd like to direct your attention to the first paragraph on the second page to the highlighted section. You'll, we have it up on the screen where it says, quote, we are prepared to stop bidding should the price drop below $1.38 per gallon. In an industry as concentrated as the ethanol industry, would such a memo raise concerns for the FTC? Mr. Chairman, is, uh, uh, if you could give me just a bit of context, this is a memo internal to the, to the company, that is the recipient is another executive within the company? Leica is a competitor to Western Ethanol. And Mr. Vind works for Western Ethanol and Mr. Wolf works for Leica. So it's a memorandum from one rival to another rival. From, from Doug Vind with Western Ethanol to Herbert Wolf with Leica saying we are going to stop bidding, which is on the sale to BP if the price drops below $1.38. Is that the kind of behavior that the FTC looks for in determining whether or not collusion or gouging is going on? Um, if you'll accept the, the general caveat that one always would like to see the fuller context, ordinarily, when one sees one competitor telling another competitor, this is our bidding strategy, this is how we will bid, that is a very provocative document. Is this qualify as a provocative document? Um, now, if, if, if you'll allow me uh, the, 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 the partial caveat that uh, to, to study it in more detail and to know more about the context would be helpful, were I simply reading this in the abstract and I saw one rival tell another rival, uh, this is my bidding strategy and this is how I would bid, I would want to have a very good reason for why that, that well, was said. Well, you can see why I'm so interested. Over yes. on the floor of the other body, we're debating a proposal by the majority leader of the Senate to, frankly, legislative embed, legislatively embed a monopoly, and we've got competitors who, frankly, are communicating with each other. And my question of you is, is this a provocative enough statement or document to merit an investigation? And you're telling me maybe. Um, I would, I would put it at a, a, a higher level than maybe. I would say this, this is, the, is, is almost invariably the kind of statement that would invite further inquiry. How many such documents do you need? Uh, quite often it is a single document that sets things in motion. Allison, or a single conversation. Give them the second document. Document number two on the screen, 
is a memo written by Mr. Venn from Regent International, which is the parent company of Western Ethanol, to a Mr. Bach at ADM, ADM in this reference, I believe is Archer Daniels Midland, regarding a bid for ethanol out of France. The man referred to in the memo is apparently ED and F Man Alcohols, which is an ethanol supplier based in London. If you could look at the second paragraph, the second sentence, which reads, quote, in order to avoid a showdown or bidding contest, I agreed to this request. Therefore, man will be bidding on the 75,000 hectoliters out of France at a price of 5.02, I presume that's French francs. It may be European currency units. I would suggest that ADM underbid at a price of 4.85. This will serve as a safety net in the event that man's bid is rejected, it says, of any reason. Just a moment is rejected for any reason. Given the concentration in the ethanol industry, would such a memo indicating apparent cooperation among three ethanol suppliers be of concern to the FTC? Yes. Give them the third document. I'm not running out of documents, by the way. Document number three is a second memo from Vend to Bach regarding another purchase of alcohol from the European Union. Quote, this will confirm that ADM will be bidding 5.9 ECU, European currency units, on a Spanish tender and somewhat less, paren, say 5.75 in paren, on Italian tender. I assume you have discussed with man and that all is okay, end quote. Would such a history of cooperation among companies in a concentrated industry concern the FTC? Yes. Would a pattern of such cooperation going back several years concern the FTC? Yes. Would you like the documents one by one, or would you like them in total? Any order you like, sir. Allison, give them the binder. We're going to submit these to you for your consideration. We'd be happy to go through them one by one with you. We are directly inquiring of the FTC whether or not these documents constitute a need for an investigation as to the concentration in the ethanol industry. The inquiry is timely, is justified. We're in the process of setting legislative policy for the next 20 years having to do whether or not to embed in statute a mandate for use of ethanol in an industry that, at least on its face, is extremely concentrated and engaged in price collusion or gouging. We will do that, and could I ask the Chairman's permission if we find that there are other government institutions, perhaps with more formidable remedies, that might have an interest in the same materials, would, would you we permit would me to that. pass these along as yes. well? Yes. I would, I would mention as we were uh, going through the types of evidence that are helpful, I would, I would also mention that certainly where there is the cooperation of a company insider that that has also been an indispensable ingredient in pursuing inquiries. And in the ADM ca lysine case that we referred to before, in fact, it was a tip from a company insider that was a crucial piece of evidence for the Department of Justice in its inquiry. I do recall the investigation that was well reported in the Wall Street Journal and other media. We have no more uh, verbal questions for this panel. We do have some, and we are going to leave the record open for submittal of written questions. We do appreciate your attendance today. The record will be open for 10 days as it relates to this panel. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. before you do submit some, uh, Certainly. Uh, I, I would just like to, to comment on the questions that you, you asked and, and just say that they, besides being provocative, um, they're, they're somewhat alarming. And um, 
uh, I would, I'd like to know uh, what the response will be back. I'd love to, when you have a chance to look at the, this information a little bit more and to inquire um, uh, when you would be getting back to this committee so that we could um, have an assessment of how you evaluate them. Uh, Congressman, I don't, I, I don't have an immediate prediction, but uh, the types of materials we've just discussed briefly are, are indeed, uh, if not simply provocative, perhaps alarming as well. Um, uh, could, could we perhaps have a, a day or so to, to give you a, a more precise if, if, response? If, yeah, if you could give the committee, but I think the committee needs to have some dialogue back as to uh, what, what your impression is and what you're doing with this information. We will not I'd be pleased share, to do that. We will not only share these items, obviously, with Mr. Kovacic, but we'll provide copies to all the members of the committee. I believe you, I mean, we've got some over here, but uh, got happy Great. to provide thank that. I want to thank this panel for attending today. Uh, I'm sorry we went so long. Apologize for that. Uh, we will have written questions. We appreciate a timely response. Mr. Kovacic, we'll hear from you sooner rather than later. Yes, sir. Thank you all. We'll take a five-minute recess. I'm David Montgomery from Seattle. Gary Roberts wanted me to say hello. back to order. Uh, we're going to have the second panel join us now. As you saw in the first panel, we swear in our witnesses. So if you would all rise, please, and raise your right hand. We're missing somebody. Say again. Mr. Economides, are you here? He can either be he can either be sworn in or sworn at or something. I don't know. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll swear him in when he gets here. We're going to get started. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. We have with us today three, soon to be four, uh, panelists for the second panel. The first is the Vice President of the Charles River Associates, Mr. David Montgomery. Our next, who will join us shortly, is the Director of the Heart Downstream Energy Services, Mr. Nicholas Economides. Our third is a Professor of Economics from my alma mater, Dr. Gordon Rouser. And the fourth is an Environmental Consultant to the American Lung Association, Mr. A. Blakeman Early. Gentlemen, welcome. Appreciate you taking the time. We have received your written statements. They've been reviewed here. I've read them. If you could summarize within five minutes, that would certainly expedite things. If Mr. Economides does not get here, by the time you're done, we will skip him and go to you. Mr. Montgomery, you're recognized for five minutes. You need to turn on that microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Um, I was honored by your invitation to uh, testify today, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I have a feeling that anything we will say might be an anticlimax, so I will try to be brief. Uh, I'd like to start by summarizing a little bit of the commentary I made on crude oil prices. Uh, crude oil prices have certainly run back up in the last few months um, due to a number of factors, including OPEC supply cuts and international tensions. Uh, but they have not reached the levels they reached even two years ago. This has happened before. I think it does serve as an important reminder about, of how important energy security is as a policy issue and national concern. At this point, it's my assessment that things could get better or worse in the short run, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, but I think maybe the best preparation is realizing in terms of world oil markets that effects of supply disruptions have always been temporary, and I see no reason to expect that that would not be the case now. 
If you could put up figure one of my prepared testimony, I just want to refer briefly to this to be sure that the picture is clear. Um, it shows the last 13 years of crude oil prices. What's more important is the general shape than anything that you can't read at this point on the screen. Um, and what it shows is that prices spiked in the Gulf War. They've gone up and down, then very far down. They went up quite far. The uh, peak closest to the right, the peak almost to the far right is in the year 2000. They dropped to about $13 a barrel and they've climbed back up. Um, they've averaged around $20 a barrel for this whole period and for far further back than that. Um, the price have always returned to something like $20 a barrel with maybe a 1% per year trend of growth in, in current prices. The other thing that I think is most interesting is what we've plotted here are those little pennants that are blowing to starboard. Um, they indicate what the futures market was saying at each point in time. Where they're attached to the flagpole is the date of the future of the recorded prices, and then their price is looking forward generally three to five years. And they show the futures market has always also been predicting that prices will come back to $20 a barrel, and it continues to do so. Probably a little bit slower than I, the prices have actually collapsed. And I think this is something to keep in mind as we look at world oil markets and high prices. The first one being prices certainly have not come back even to the levels we saw two years ago, despite the horrible tensions in world markets. And if the supply disruptions disappear, prices are likely to come back down again. Um, another comment is, I don't think that at this point further price increases are in the economic interest of Saudi Arabia. Um, it has already cut production to the point where, in my opinion, increasing its own production by, say, 10 percent would reduce world oil pri prices by less than 10 percent. That is, Saudi Arabia has a sufficiently small market share that it actually would be better off by having more production than it does today. Um, I think that implies a growing incentive to raise production. Uh, it also makes me believe that any further tightening of the market that we might see permitted by OPEC is for political and not economic reasons. Um, by the same token, reductions in U.S. oil imports would tend to lower world oil prices with benefits to the U.S. and to our allies. And getting back to the point of this hearing, I think the policies that restrict supply or increase demand without corresponding environmental benefits simply make matters worse on world oil markets. Um, I'd now like to say a few words about gasoline prices. I think that was discussed very capably earlier this morning, this afternoon, especially by Mary Hutzler from EIA. Um, gasoline prices have gone up a bit more than crude oil. And if we could show my figure two, um, it lists some of the reasons that I think are responsible for that. This is also available at the back of my prepared testimony. Um, I calculate that the increase in the price of crude oil this year is responsible for about 21 cents per gallon of cost increase. The price of gasoline go has gone up about 30 cents a gallon. That leaves about 9 cents that's due to the other frac factors, including the specific tightness of the gasoline market, the turnaround for producing summer gasoline, the cost of producing reformulated gasoline, which is higher in the summer than the winter, and probably a couple pennies a gallon for royalties that Unical is, is demanding on patents it's recently asserted on reformulated gasoline. Um, right now, crude and product inventories are near the top of their normal range. And I think filling those inventories is also an important cause of the higher gasoline prices as a precaution against the events on the world oil market. Um, terminals and refineries have, are holding higher stocks than we've seen as normal for this time of year. That's put some upward pressure on current prices, but it's a good thing because it means in a purely private market-driven response, we're better capable of weathering future supply disruptions, and that's kind of how the market works when it sees unstable prices. In terms of the refining industry itself, I think you have already discussed many of the points and calculations that I discussed about uh, in my testimony about um, concentration in the industry. Um, it is an industry that's a classic commodity industry, petroleum refining. The history of the last 25 years has been long periods of depressed profits with very short intervals of profitability in tight markets. And these occasional tight markets are actually all that have kept profits positive in the long run for the industry. Um, when there's excess capacity, as there has been for much of the past decade, gasoline prices are set by competitive forces at something close to the cost of just keeping the refinery running. No return on capital. When demand exceeds capacity, there is a genuine scarcity and prices rise to the level that it takes to bring demand down to that level. Reformulated gasoline requirements that balkanize markets make that even more of a uh, 
of a, a potential problem. Let me say two words about concentration and then I will stop. Uh, the first one is that um, it strikes me that uh, concentration and refining does not reach levels of concern in the kind of geographic markets I talked about. I think there are reasons for concern in the ethanol industry. I will stop there. Thank you. I thank, thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Uh, Mr. Comines, we need to swear you in, as we did the other witnesses. If you'd please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show the witness answered in the affirmative. Mr. Comines, you are recognized for five minutes. We have received your written testimony, and we've read it. If you could summarize, that would be wonderful. Uh, Chairman Nasi, I want to thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today to address the issues related to our national fuel markets and the ongoing debate related to gasoline price volatility. Uh, our country faces significant ongoing structural problems related to fuel supply and distribution that are likely to cause rapid gasoline price increases to continue to occur in the future, perhaps with even larger frequency and at greater magnitude than those we have experienced so far. As you said earlier, even today, the Senate is debating provisions of uh, an energy bill as part of our overall national energy policy that could drastically alter the, comp the composition of our uh, gasoline supply. There are many variables that, taken together, create an extremely tight U.S. gasoline supply. They include increased reliance on imported oil, and I think that has been covered sufficiently by previous uh, panelists. Suffice it to say that we have relied on not only on imported oil, but also on imported product. And this additional imported fuel has helped the U.S. meet growing demand without adding significant new refining capacity. However, the combination of increasingly complex U.S. fuel specifications and the potential ethanol mandate will likely significantly diminish the availability of imported refined products. Second area is the contraction of U.S. refining capacity. Since 1981, the total number of refineries in the U.S. has fallen from 324 to only 149. I think this subject has also been covered, but it's important to also note that without new refining capacity, the combination of fewer gasoline components and diminishing fuel imports could result in, in fairly severe supply shortages and price spikes in the future. The proliferation of a variety of gasoline blends has also been brought up in front of this committee. We have over 16 different categories of gasoline blends in the U.S. Even if we assume that premium and, and uh, regular unleaded are, are blended at the pump to make mid-grade, that means 32 different products are moving through different parts of our supply system in the country. Uh, we, we need to start working on getting that down, and we're pleased to see both API and NPRA recognize that need in, in recent months. Environmentally uh, beneficial gasolines have been brought up, especially the, trans the seasonal transition to make summer gasoline and what that entails. There are legitimate reasons why it costs refiners more to produce summer gasoline. Volatility controls require that summer gasoline ex exhibit a lower tendency to evaporate. Lighter components such as butanes that are included in the fuel in the wintertime must be removed in the summer. This removal of light compo uh, compounds for volatility control is rapidly compounded into additional volume loss as refiners move to rebalance the fuel. The bottom line is this, while summer gasoline clearly offers superior smog fighting characteristics, we can make less of it. Nearly all of the steps required to produce it involve volume reduction. We normally lose sense of this summer volume loss because we deal with the issue preferentially in terms of increased refiner production cost. We make the mistake of not recognizing that cost to produce has very little to do with the actual price rise seen in the market. It is the supply shrinkage, real or anticipated, that causes gasoline prices to advance rapidly. Short-term, refiners do seek the handsome reward of increased prices by trying to squeeze every barrel they can during such periods, and that's as it should be. The problem lies with the long-term outlook. After years of excess capacity, low prices, and underperforming assets, refiners are hesitant to invest in capacity throughput increases 
even though the excess capacity has vanished prices are now higher and a reasonable case for return on investment can be made i'd like to close with a few comments on on five seventeen and the ethanol situation heart my company has long held that ethanol has a role in our nation's gasoline supply particularly in the midwest the questions that remain are what are the costs associated with ethanol use and what are the implications on gasoline supply and price volatility as it now stands the provisions of five seventeen would mandate the use of ethanol and ban the use of mtb among other fuel composition changes we believe that five seventeen will likely cause gasoline supplies to shrink significantly causing more price volatility than EIA study predicts. There are three major areas that we want to highlight. The first area involves the proposed ban on MTB. MTB comprises of significant volumes in, in the nation's gasoline. Uh, DOE has pointed out that MTB is the equivalent of 400,000 barrels of gasoline production. Mr. Economides, we're going to give you 40 seconds to wrap That's, up here. That will be more than sufficient. Thank you. Uh, the second uh, important area involves the, the renewable fuel standard. This is probably a step in the wrong direction as far as the stability of the nation's gasoline supply is concerned. Ethanol does not extend summer gasoline supplies, at least not if one performs the analysis on the basis of equal environmental performance and constant vehicle miles traveled. We must also recognize that the reduced volume and added cost will come in trying to get summer gasoline blended with ethanol to perform equivalently in areas such as drivability and to recognize the reduction in its energy content measured in BTU where it has at least two to three percent less energy content than non-oxygenated gasoline. Many of these points are conveniently finessed in most ethanol studies to date. As a result, the estimates we have seen are gen and have been generated at, at the very low end of the range of what can actually happen in the marketplace. And with that, I will conclude and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Economides. Dr. Rouser, visiting us from the University of California at Berkeley. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I thank the committee for inviting me to offer an analysis of the social cost and benefits of MTB use in gasoline and its planned ban in the state of California. 18 months ago, I was retained by Lyondell Chemical to assess uh, whether the continued use and or ban of MTBE in gasoline in California would be a choice that on the balance served or did not serve the public interest. To answer this question, my colleagues and I have performed a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis within the framework of the current federal and state of California reformulated gasoline requirements. We've relied on the extensive literature that's been accumulated over the course of the last decade and surveys that we ourselves conducted on the impacts with regard to air, water, and fuel cost. And we've done this not only for MTBE, but for ethanol. And as you would expect, there's much more data, much more science about MTBE because of its wide use in the state of California over the last decade relative to ethanol. Uh, we've submitted our analysis for independent peer review and publication. The basis for my opinions that I'm going to share with you today is first, that we look at all the potential consequences, whether they're good or bad, of both MTBE and ethanol in gasoline. Each of the effects is quantified in monetary terms to allow us to compare using the same yardstick with regard to both the benefits and cost. Our focus is on the incremental cost to society of using MTBE or ethanol. For instance, when gasoline is found in groundwater, costs will be incurred to diagnose and clean up to spill whether or not MTB or ethanol are present. Our concern was to measure the extent to which MTBE and, in comparison, ethanol influenced those incremental costs. We also focused exclusively on the annual cost going forward. Ongoing cost of cleanup identified, cleanups identified in the past should be irrelevant to policymakers as those costs will be incurred whether or not MTBE is banned in the future. As we all recognize, factors that affect the expected costs and benefits looking out over the next decade or next 20 years are subject to significant uncertainty. 
we incorporate in our analysis that uncertainty reflecting the best available science with regard to each of the major impacts that I briefly outlined. What are our results? Um, first of all, even though the anticipated air quality benefits of oxygenated gasoline were in fact realized, the large-scale use of MTBE, as we all know, uh, has resulted in adverse impacts on water quality. The use of MTBE exposed in a dramatic fashion the fundamental problem, which is the source control <coughs> with leaking underground storage tanks. While the widespread use of MTBE has had adverse impacts on water quality, removal of MTBE from gasoline will impose significant other costs on society, both in terms of gasoline production cost and ultimate prices at the consumer level. Overall, the continued use of MTBE in California has clear and significant benefits relative to the use of ethanol. The increased annual cost resulting from a ban of MTBE in California when ethanol replaces MTBE ranges on an annual basis, as I just indicated, from a little less than a billion to about $1.3 billion with an expected or, or uh, median value of $1.24 billion per year. These results are robust to any possible ranges on uncertainty. Even if you take the worst case for MTBE and the best case for ethanol, it still follows that banning MTBE and substituting with ethanol imposes significant cost on society, where society is measured not only in terms of the citizens of the state of California, but the citizens in the rest of the United States. Okay, the potential impacts from significantly changing the manufacture of a product as important and pervasive as gasoline is quite obviously and predictably complex. As a result, the cost-benefit analysis that we've conducted is also complex, but it can be decomposed into three major categories the impacts on fuel costs, the impacts on air quality, and then finally, and most importantly in terms of the general view of the public with regard to MTBE use, the impacts on water quality. First, the impacts on fuel cost. Substituting ethanol for MTBE and reformulated ga gasoline will result in increase, increases in fuel cost. Changes in fuel cost can be categorized into six different consequences. The first, and perhaps the most important, is an increase in the cost to the U.S. economy due to the increased oil imports to make up the fuel volume lost when switching from MTBE to ethanol. Also, there is an increase in cost to refiners to manufacture reformulated gasoline. There's an increase in the ethanol tax subsidy payments. Fourth, there's an increase in gasoline demand due to lower fuel mi mileage. Fifth, there's a consumer surplus loss attributable to reduced fuel consumption. And finally, there's changes in the market for natural gas that actually work in favor of ethanol as opposed to MTBE. But if you take all these six impacts and summarize them, you end up with an expected incremental cost of $1.33 billion per year if you substitute ethanol for MTBE. The impacts on air quality are basically commensurate. There's a bit of difference in terms of the air toxics associated with reformulated gasoline with MTBE versus um, ethanol, but the differences are not dramatic. On the water quality side, here, as I indicated, the focus has to be on the incremental response costs going Dr. forward. Dr. you need to summarize. Okay. And looking at those incremental costs and sorting those out, we almost also have to recognize that there's some recent science suggesting strongly that ethanol has an adverse impact on water quality as well in terms of delaying the biodegradability of BTEX plumes. If you take that all into account, the costs that are incurred by banning MTBE and switching to ethanol results in a benefit that ranges anywhere from 5.2 million to 296 million with an expected value of 59 million. Now, those results may be a bit surprising for those who think about all of the past consequences and instead don't focus on the incremental cost. If you look at the incremental cost, then the numbers that I presented to you are reasonable uh, estimates. 
in addition it also says that the fundamental problem is focusing on the underground storage tanks and that's what we have to deal with thank you very much mr chairman this concludes my brief remarks thank you dr rouser uh, our fourth panelist on this panel is a blakeman early an environmental consultant with the american lung association welcome you're recognized for five minutes thank you mr chairman um, I'm here because the American Lung Association strongly supports uh, the use of clean fuels to reduce air pollution. And we are very concerned that the current situation is untenable, the status quo is untenable, and it is uh, impacting public support for clean fuels programs. And of course, it is um, uh, contributing to uh, the whole concern about the, the price of gasoline. The uh, American Lung Association participated in the Blue Ribbon panel on oxygenates and gasoline and, uh, and uh, endorse their recommendations. And those recommendations, we think, are really a blueprint for the kinds of changes that should be made to RFG and con conventional gasoline. And those recommendations start with getting rid of MTBE. You can debate the value of MTBE in fuel. It's clearly a valu valuable product, but the public wants MTBE out of fuel. They don't want to hear any more debate about this. They want it out. That's why 14 states have already banned it, including the state of Connecticut uh, and the state of California. And that's why five more new Northeast states are likely to, to follow suit. Um, it is the existence of MTBE in reformulated gasoline that, we, that contributes to the proliferation of boutique fuels, according to an EPA study, because people want a fuel without MTBE, so they make up their own fuel formula. Um, if you take MTBE out of gasoline, you are going to have a significant cost hit. And if you look at the EIA study, to get back to uh, Mr. Chairman, your opening statement, the fair comparison has to be banning MTBE, which 14 to 19 states have already done, and what that cost is versus S517. And if you look at figures 17 and 18 in the EIA analysis, a half to three quarters of the cost that they are discussing are from banning MTBE not from the renewable fuel standard and, and, and the other requirements of S-517. So that is where the cost is, um, and it is not going to be ins insignificant. A very key element uh, that has to be adopted in legislation has to be the elimination of the oxygen requirement, because if you don't eliminate the oxygen re requirement, you're back to the status quo of banning MTBE, and in the states that use reformulated gasoline, they are going to have to use massive amounts of ethanol. Uh, under, uh, under that scenario, if we don't get rid of the oxygen requirement, California needs 800 million gallons of ethanol every year. The Northeast needs over 700 million gallons. Um, now, under the compromise in S-517, which the American Lung Association supports with one exception, uh, we get rid of the oxygen requirement we ban MTBE, and we have a renewable fuel standard which enables refiners to use ethanol where it's produced and where it's already used, rather than forcing massive amounts of ethanol to the East Coast and to the West Coast. We think this is a, a practical approach to dealing with a very difficult political problem, which is maintaining ethanol use, uh, but doing it in a way that has the least adverse impact, both on price and the environment. Um, if you adopt the changes in S-517, which includes a renewable fuel standard, even if every gallon of the renewable fuel standard was used for, e for ethanol, was used in California and in the Northeast, the amount of ethanol used in those two areas would be one-third the level that was that would be required under the status quo where you ban MTBE and you maintain the oxygen requirement. One third the usage. But of course, under S-517, there is a credit trading and banking program which would enable refiners who supply both the Northeast and California to use another substitute instead of ethanol. In our case, our belief is significant amounts of alkylate and isooctane would be substituted for ethanol. And then they could meet their RFS requirement with uh, buying credits, and therefore that will moderate the, the cost impact. To sum up, Mr. Chairman, um, 
The Congress has been deadlocked over legislation to eliminate MTBE and improve federal requirements for RFG and conventional gasoline for years. With the exception of the liability safe harbor in S-517, we think this legislation represents a compromise that addresses a wide variety of concerns, and the American uh, Lung Association hopes that Congress will grasp this unique opportunity to, to move ahead and make the constructive changes that we need in the law. I also wanted to introduce for the record a, uh, an endorsement of, of the changes in S-517 by NESCOM, which is the Association of Northeast Air Officials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hearing no objection, we will enter that into the record. Thank you, Mr. Early, for your testimony. Mr. Economides, in your testimony, you state that you think the EIA analysis understates the cost to consumers, uh, and that's, that's referring to the cost of having ethanol as the oxygenate in the fuel. Uh, how much more will consumers, in your opinion, how much more will consumers pay at the pump if Senator Daschle's proposal on fuel provisions is passed and signed by the President? At the pump, sir, is um, clearly a matter of uh, gasoline supply impact, shrinkage, you know, shortfall. Uh, the numbers from EIA and, and, and from our organization have dealt almost exclusively in differences in the cost to produce gasoline, and we are uh, higher than EIA. Uh, we think that a number of factors uh, involved in the assumptions that EIA has made tend to produce a, an estimate on the low side. EIA but was at 6.37 billion. And you yeah, were we 8. were, we were 8.4, and that was, again, the difference in cost to produce gasoline. Your inquiry regarding at the pump, uh, you need to factor in things as the potential shrinkage in gasoline supply of having a, sh a switch from, from MTB to ethanol, which could be as much as uh, 5 or 10 percent of gasoline at that point, depending on the area we're talking about. That will dwarf anything we're talking about from a production cost difference for refiners. Um, we, we let, me, let me make sure I understand what you said. What you just said was that the cost would be about 6.37 to 8.4 billion, based on these estimates, to manufacture the fuel, and that the cost in the marketplace to the consumer will be, will dwarf that. Yeah, I think, I think what you're going to see in the marketplace so will it'd be, be higher. More we'll see okay. more of a function of the overall further shrinking and tightening of gasoline supply, which will create the kinds of spikes in volatility that we heard Mr. Montgomery talk about, which is the type of periods where uh, refineries uh, have traditionally uh, been profitable. Uh, the issue here is not so much production cost. Production cost is significant directionally, and it does amount to that large number, and I don't want to underestimate the significance of that number, but I am very afraid that in terms of retail, in terms of what the consumer might see, we may be looking at something substantially higher than that if we shrink gasoline supply even further. Are you suggesting that the people who might otherwise produce or refine the product may incur 6.37 to 8.4 billion in added cost and reap multiples of that in added revenue? The market will bear the, the cost to equilibrate uh, demand with supply. I think that the more we shrink supply, the higher the likelihood that prices will go up, more than offsetting whatever the incremental cost to produce the fuel is. I, I, I called it dwarfing a second ago, and I still think that's the case. Um, we is that like a three to one ratio? I mean, when you. Well, two to if, one? if we argue about. Uh, Items I'm in just the trying 10, to get cent, some 10, cent, sense. 10 cent gasoline cost to produce increase or less, two, three, four, five for conventional. Uh, we can turn to California during periods of supply shortages. We can turn to the Midwest during the year 2000 uh, summer shortage, and you can easily see 35 and 50 cent price increases out there where, where you know, your factor becomes obvious at that point. This w I mean, just the logic that you put forward would indicate that the people who would otherwise produce the reformulated gasoline would make a pretty good rate of return on that 6.37 to 8.4 billion dollars in added cost. For that period of time. For every one of those periods of times, you need to factor the other ones where they're barely keeping their noses above water. All right.
You've already uh, answered my next question, that is uh, whether there's a price difference between RFG and conventional gasoline. You said in California it's 10 to 5, 10 cents add-on versus 5 cents add-on. Uh, will some people in this country pay more because at the pump because they live in areas where reformulated gasoline is required than others might pay? I think your answer uh, would be yes. Yes, the answer to that is yes. I don't think the cost to reform, most of the studies we've done have identified a broad brush cost for reformulated gasoline and they make a distinction between those two categories, conventional versus reformulated. Within the category of reformulated gasoline, there could very well be a difference in the cost to produce and in the retail pr price of that product, depending on what market we're talking about. Clearly, California has historically been above the rest of the nation. Its reformulated gasoline requires additional emissions reductions above and beyond those provided for in the federal. Okay, uh, so we've got all these different provisions in this bill that Senator Daschle has put forward. What's the total price tag? We have taken a shot at, at this point to try to identify uh, the cost of getting MTB out of the fuel, the cost of getting that much ethanol into the fuel and partially offsetting that by the benefit of having the oxygen standard uh, be relaxed as a constraint on the system. We have tried to do this at constant environmental performance because we believe that none of this discussion of taking MTB out, bringing ethanol in, was ever to be done under the assumption that air quality would deteriorate in any part of the country. Having done that, the number that you have in front of you represents our mid-case scenario. 8.4 billion. That's correct. However, we at this point do not have factors in there including uh, potential ethanol pricing impacts in a market that is as concentrated as it is and as we heard earlier, uh, you know, you, you are really moving into an environment where you have a subsidized ethanol tax subsidy mandated and liability protected environment. Uh, the combination of the three does not speak very well as to what what the potential price impact could be. And I, and I hate to take a shot at the, at the high side. I've, in fact, purposely avoided doing that so far. My time has expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Konamidis, I'm not sure uh, about your organization. Uh, do you, you represent individual clients? Well, our organization uh, has affiliations with different uh, stakeholders in the air quality emissions arena. Are any of them the uh, MTBE industry? Yes, we have clients in the MTBE industry. We have automaker clients. We have refining industry clients. We have regulatory agency body Anybody clients. Anybody from the ethanol industry? Yes. And so they you cover both yes. of those? Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rouser, I was, I was trying to understand your uh, study and looking at that. And, and I would assume that in the context of, of your work, you, you made some assumption regarding the, the leaks on the upgraded gasoline tanks. Did you assume that, uh, that they would be constant or that they would diminish or? No, that the upgrading was increasing in the state of California. And I took that into account. And there's a different leakage rate with regard to the non-upgraded tanks versus the upgraded tanks. But having said that, there's still a leakage rate with regard to the upgraded tanks as well. And, and I guess it's quite considerable by recent accounts, am I right? No, not in the state of California. The detection rates have fallen uh, rather dramatically over the course of the last few years. Would you use something about 0.07% or whatever is the leakage rate in your uh, analysis? Yes, for the upgraded tanks. Well, why do I see then that in, in California, uh, the, the results of their state study found that two-thirds of the upgraded tanks and pipes that were tested in certain counties were leaking MTBE, and in other counties yeah. at least a third were, were leaking, in Silicon Valley, at least 40 percent of the tested due tanks were releasing MTBE. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's considerably higher than, than the right. fact what you used. Uh, no, I don't believe it is because my rate is an annual rate. And the rate that you're referring to is the accumulation of a number of different prior years. Well, actually, there can't be too many prior years to judge from, right? These are relatively well, new tanks. Well, but no, but the upgrading uh, of underground storage tanks has been going on in the state of California since 1990. And so you say that 40 percent of the new tanks really is somehow interpreted by you as a much smaller percentage. No, what I'm saying is that my rate is an annual rate. If I take that annual rate and accumulate it over a period of time, I'm going to get numbers that are close to those that you've just quoted. 
Well, you've lost me, but I, I mean, it, it seems to me if they're leaking, they're leaking, and it's going to continue to leak onto the future because these new tanks aren't stopping it. The new tanks are decreasing the leakage rate, uh, but yes, they are continuing uh, to exhibit leaking rates, and that estimate that I gave you, or that I've used in my particular model, is an estimate that's based on a survey that was done at the University of California, Davis, on the annual incidence of leaking, not the accumulation of what's been discovered already. So you based it on an older study? Pardon? You, the study you based it on is somewhat older. Yes, it's 1997, to be precise. And yes. I, the cost, the same report indicates the cost of uh, contamination, MTBE contamination in soil and water nationwide is going to be at least $29 billion to clean it up. Who's the, what's the source of this study? Is this this the, is the, uh, the study from the state of California. Yes, but it's for the entire but U.S. It's for the entire it's, United States. Right. Um, I don't believe that particular. I've seen reference to those those numbers, and I don't believe that we've got the underlying analysis that they've conducted to see whether or not it can be duplicated. Number one, but more importantly, uh, that is an estimate that refers to the prior cost of cleanup for what's already taken place. As I indicated, my analysis focuses on the cost going forward. Well, we've got $29 billion to clean up, 29. and the new contamination sites continue to be discovered. That's so it's right. It's not going to end. So well, if you're at $29 billion now, you're going to have additional monies to clean up as the new sites are discovered. Right. So the, that's, you compare that to your slightly 1.2 or whatever it was billion dollars a year cost. I mean, that, that's a lot of money going out. Right, but much of what you've just described is the historical occurrence that's already taken place that is cost that's going to have to be incurred by those who are li liable for the remediation. If we're looking going forward and we're comparing the different options that are available for reformulated gasoline, again, under the current regulations, the scenario on those costs are much lower than they would have been historically because of the detection methodologies that are out there because of learning that natural attenuation can work in some cases. But I'm sorry, but you're, st you're still assuming that some 0.07% is what's going to leak, right? Each year, there, the probability is 0.07 that a particular underground storage tank will, will leak. That's correct. But the recent studies indicate that it's much higher than that. No, I don't believe they do. Well, I don't think that's... All right. that, so these people are smoking something, then? I mean, they, they, no, I, I'm just... All I'm saying is that if you look at the data with regard to, in, in particular, X component, it's done a lot of analysis with regard to each of the regional water quality districts in the state of California, and they've gone out and estimated the differential leaking rate between upgraded versus not non-upgraded tanks, and they have confirmed the Couch et al. study that was done that you referred to a moment ago in 1997. In fact, the detection rates are lower than what that particular study would suggest as of today. I think we disagree, but I'm not going to keep going back and forth with them. I mean, I think they, their indications, the way I'm reading it, is that they're still getting significant leakage and they anticipate continued leakage on well into the future, and that's a cost that is not going to go away and is not going to diminish. Mr. Tierney, what I'd also... Huh. Thank you, Mr. Early. Go ahead. What I'd like to observe, Mr. Tierney, is uh, we learned in participating in the Blue Urban Panel that the public wants 0 percent leakage of MTBE in the groundwater. The 0 0.07 is a low number, but it's not low enough in terms of what the, the American public demand. And the other thing I would observe is that California has one of the best tank programs in the country. This, you're not going to achieve this kind of uh, um, low leakage level in other states. Thank you. Do you want to go back to question? Yeah. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Conomedes, if I may, I want to return to your testimony, which says, uh, quote, ethanol, if used to replace MTBE in summer, I love these acronyms. <laughs> I'm going to say it in English. Ethanol, if used to replace, except for MTBE, ethanol, if used <laughs> to replace MTBE in summer reformulated gasoline at the minimum level of oxygen currently required in reformulated gasoline will actually shrink the current gasoline pool by approximately 11 percent, end quote. Can you explain how that math works out? Well, very simply, if you start with a base gasoline that doesn't contain oxygen, and we call that 100 percent, 
and we add 11% MTBE, which is basically what is required to satisfy the 2% minimum oxygen requirement in uh, RFG, we, we wind up with a volume of about 111%. Now, if we take out that 11% MTBE and we instead insert 5.7 or 6% ethanol, which is roughly the amount that you would need to get the same oxygen content of 2%, you need to remove roughly the same amount of light components, pentanes and lighter, from the gasoline in order to accommodate the ethanol's volatility characteristics. So you wind up in a 98 point something or 99 point something environment versus your 100 percent starting point as opposed to the 111 uh, percent volume expansion that you had with the addition of MTBE. Now, the, the counter argument to that, of course, from an ethanol proponent standpoint is why don't you put the maximum amount of ethanol that one can put in the fuel? And if you do that, then you're talking about adding 10 percent ethanol in. You still need to remove that 5, 6 percent of volatiles, uh, volatile gasoline components to allow that. So you get a modest expansion at that point at 102, 103, 103 and a half volume percent, but still that pales by comparison to the 111 that you are currently operating under. That's so you're, you're doing a comparative uh, volume analysis right, right. between trying to figure out how gas much the with gasoline MTBE pool will gas shrink with ethanol. Okay. Now, does that mean that the U.S. is going to have to find more fuel? We certainly think that imports are um, uh, looming larger in our future. They represent 5 percent of our supply now, I think, roughly a much larger percentage for the local areas like the Northeast. You're talking about refined uh, products? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, refined gasoline imports uh, in the Northeast likely to increase, uh, particularly if the ethanol credit trading pr uh, provision, which will be required to keep the economics of ethanol in some kind of a reasonable ballpark, keep the ethanol in what we have called pads two and, and four. Uh, if that happens, then to make up the volume shortages, we'll have to be talking about imports hitting uh, New York Harbor in, in much larger quantities than they have in the past. All right, these, in, these imported refined products, are they refined from crude produced in the United States? Mm, doubtful. So we don't drill here, pump it, ship it overseas, refine it, ship it back? Doubtful. We're, We're talking basically about foreign using crude, foreign sources of foreign oil. Foreign sources of crude being refined most likely in foreign refineries and being brought in tankers. Can I act accurately characterize your statement then? to be that an ethanol mandate will make the U.S. more dependent on foreign oil? I certainly disagree with a blanket statement that has been made that one of the reasons why we need an ethanol mandate is to reduce our reliance on foreign oil. I see no sanity in that statement. You've uh, punctured that logic. Well, yeah. I mean, I, did, I mean so. whether or not it will, it will significantly uh, um, increase our reliance on foreign oil, I, I I think that remains to be seen at what level ethanol will be added or what level refiners finally get over their hesitance in expanding their capacity. As I said earlier, we've had a period, and as Mr. Montgomery pointed out, of underperforming assets and very, very uh, depressed market conditions, and they have been hesitant. We will see a period of increased prices demonstrated consistently before those purse strings are loosened and massive investment takes place. All right, Mr. Montgomery, uh, in your testimony, you state that policies that increase oil import, imports impose harm on the U.S. economy. Direct quote. Do you agree or disagree that Senator Daschle's fuel provisions will increase our reliance on foreign oil? Yes, we've performed essentially the same type of analysis that Mr. Economides described, and I certainly agree with him that the shrink that replaced Removing MTB from gasoline, whether it's replaced with enough ethanol to you know, satisfy the requirements for reformulated gasoline or not, is going to substantially shrink the gasoline pool. It will, as he stated, require the use of additional crude oil to produce the product, the, the blending products that are needed to get the volume back up that is lost in MTB. Um, what that will do is increase oil imports, and the harm that that will, will produce for the U.S. economy is it will put upward pressure on world oil prices, 
and it will also put upward pressure on gasoline prices by tightening the market and resulting in prices essentially going up probably more than costs. Will it dwarf the costs? Well, actually, there are two pieces to it. Let me try to separate them out. Mr. Montgomery, my time has expired. We're going to come back to that question. Mr. Tierney. Thank you. I guess it would be the wrong panel to talk about just not using as much gasoline, which might not be a bad way of approaching some of this, but since this isn't the right group to talk about that, Mr. Early, enlighten me, if you will. The oxygenate requirement of 2 percent, is that absolutely necessary? No. Why not? Well, the refiners have, I think, demonstrated that you can make a reformulated gasoline that reduces air pollution without any oxygen and certainly without a 2 percent oxygen requirement. Why don't they do it? Because under the Clean Air Act, they're required to put 2 percent oxygen in the fuel, and that requirement is at the heart of the problem that we have right now. We need to get rid of that requirement. So if we eliminated that, your belief is that the refineries could produce a cleaner clean enough oil to meet the requirements that we're trying to meet with the oxygen? Well, you would also have to ask them to make sure that they produce as clean a fuel. The Blue Ribbon Panel included a so-called anti-backsliding recommendation that made sure that when refiners take MTB out of reformulated gasoline, they didn't put something bad back in. And in fact, we are getting a reduction in air toxics from existing reformulated gasoline that substantially exceeds the requirements of the Clean Air Act. And one of the things that Senator Daschle's legislation does is lock in those gains. Those added air toxics reductions are locked in so that refiners under the Senate bill have to meet the same level of air toxics reduction as they do right now while phasing out MTBE. And that's a very important element of the Senate bill. If that would — if we could do that, then why do we bother with ethanol at all? We bother with ethanol mostly because, in terms of a renewable fuel standard, mostly because there is a bipartisan block of senators ranging from Senator Wellstone on the left to Senator Grassley on the right who will not agree to getting rid of the oxygen requirement unless you replace that requirement with a renewable fuel standard. You're being very polite on this, extremely polite. But the fact is, substantially, is there any scientific need to do this? Are we doing politics, which I'll save you from saying. No, I'm happy to say we are talking politics here. We are talking politics here. Because there's no legitimate reason to have ethanol in there as a clean standard. The bottom line is we can buy ethanol easy or we can buy ethanol hard. Under the status quo, we're going to buy ethanol hard. We're going to take the ethanol, which is made in the Midwest, and we're going to ship it to California, and we're going to ship it to the Northeast, where it isn't made at considerable cost, and put it in in order to meet the 2 percent oxygen requirement in existing law. The alternative scenario is to get rid of the 2 percent oxygen requirement and have a national ethanol requirement where refiners can use ethanol where it makes sense to use ethanol, and they don't have to ship it to California, and they don't have to ship it to the Northeast unless they find that it's economically advantageous to do so. Well, if we don't have any real need on the science for ethanol as an additive or anything like that, where would it make sense to use it, other than politically? Octane. No, there's little — my testimony contains a little tab, one, which shows that when you take MTBE out, you have a major — refiners have a major loss of octane, and they don't have a whole lot of alternatives. One of the things they can do is convert MTBE manufacturing facilities to produce two substitutes, one of which is called alkylate and the other is called isooctane. And we believe a lot of refiners and merchant MTBE manufacturers will do that. Senator Daschle's bill actually has a grant program to encourage them to do that. But even if you do that, you lose volume. The, the, the net result of the substitute is low, there's less of it than there is of MTBE. And gas. ethanol is basically the only other clean octane substitute. So under any scenario, when you're taking MTBE out, ethanol is going to be playing a very 
important role, and that role all revolves around octane. Now, I've in the past suggested to the refiners that um, they do something really innovative and stop making 93 octane fuel for high test and only make 91 octane fuel, and we would reduce substantially the octane demand that you would need. But the refiners don't think that's a very good idea because, of course, they get top dollar for 93 octane gasoline. Okay, you know, I'm showing some of my ignorance on this field, so again, bear with me. But if we don't need MTBE, I assume we don't need ethanol to meet the, the clean air standards, that uh, they can refine it without either one of those products and we'll be okay, right? Well, bo both MTBE and ethanol are an important source of clean octane, and right. refiners need, need octane. Get, uh, they need octane. The only source of octane. I'm sorry? They're not the only source of octane. That's correct. Right, and you can get, the industry could go to other re sources of octane and produce and refine. Right, but they're not enough of them. I mean, in the short term, the reason ethanol will play a role is there just isn't enough alternatives, unless, of course, the refiners were to go to polluting sources of octane, which, of course, Obviously we, we agree we don't want them to do. Right. And is, is nobody exploring all the new sources of octane? Well, there's little question that um, if we enact legislation that eliminates MTBE and, and maintains the other reformula updates the reformulated gasoline requirements, refiners will have a major incentive to engage in research to develop uh, MTBE substitutes that are not ethanol. Of course, if we, if we put the language in that Senator Daschle has about absolving people from liability, uh, we run the problem that they're going to come up with new sources that, in fact, are not clean. Yes, we, we would agree that uh, this particular provision is uh, not very useful in terms of safeguarding uh, public health and the environment. It just gives a free-for-all to the industry to go out and do whatever they want to do and not have any, uh, any concern, right? Well, the attempt was to, uh, to draft it narrowly, but I think the uh, attempt did not succeed. I would agree. Thank you. Thank you for the extra time. Gentlemen, Mr. Montgomery, why wouldn't we just eliminate the 2 percent oxygenate requirement? It seems to me that would solve a lot of the issues. Let science figure out how to calibrate what comes out of the tailpipe. Be done with it. Mr. Chairman, that has always struck me as an excellent proposal, mm -hmm. and I have for decades agreed with your description of how we should be setting um, emissions how we should be designing environmental policy, which is to focus on the emissions and give industry the maximum flexibility to bring those emissions down to what we care about. I do not see that the oxygenate requirement has any role in doing that. On the other hand, I'm not convinced that we can save a lot of money by getting rid of the oxygenate requirement if at the same time we are imposing a ban on MTBE, because the cost of because we have to replace the, that 11 percent of gasoline with something. And whether we replace it with ethanol or alkylates or some other, or ETBE, we are looking at very expensive blend stocks. They're all going to add to the cost of gasoline. The choice is really among which is the lesser of two evils and which do we have enough capacity in the short run to produce. But I don't think we save, we may not but, save but, as much money as people think by- But why should the federal government decide which solution, I mean, there's got to be multiple types of chemical compounds that can give you what you need to calibrate out of the tailpipe. And I think that's a very good argument for why we should not have the oxygenate requirement. I'm just cautioning that, um, expecting that by eliminating the oxygenate requirement, we can remove a significant part of the cost of moving away from MTBE. Because you Probably have to bring something true. else in. Yes. Dr. Rauscher, do you agree with that? I certainly agree that at this juncture, uh, the motivation for the original requirements are not the same today as they were in the year 1990. Um, the vehicle upgrades that have taken place um, have changed the emissions that otherwise would have occurred uh, with conventional gasoline even today. But still, coming back to the points that have been made already, once you displace that 11 percent of volume and you have to make it up from some other place, what is the incremental cost of those other 
potential blending ingredients and what are the consequences uh, of those incremental costs on the ultimate price and, and uh, cost to the consumers who are, who are purchasing gasoline. Mr. Economides, any thoughts on this? Yeah, the, you trading in one set of concerns for another set of concerns uh, from, let's take the environmental area. If you're looking for no backsliding or equivalent of environmental performance in a post-MTB world and you turn to ethanol for help, then you have volatility concerns regarding its, uh, its uh, characteristic to evaporate readily. You have drivability concerns, distillation concerns. All these are fixable. They, they involve additional controls. And addition, which bring on additional costs, as Mr. Montgomery indicated. If in turn you go to a non-oxygenated fuel, the oxy standard is gone and we don't have an RFS, let's say, and we go to that, that world, then we need to protect against uh, what allow me the liberty to call dirty octane. And dirty octane is aromatics and olefins. And, uh, you know, for the benefit of uh, all of those who have not perhaps settled on this thought, uh, olefins is a real, real cloud in the horizon in that, in that uh, eventuality. I mean, a very active species contributing to summertime smog, so are aromatics. And they are high octane compounds, so are aromatics. Aromatics, of course, are a major culprit on the toxic side because they combust into benzene out of the tailpipe. So we have a set of concerns that need to be addressed. And, and, and one thing I want to emphasize again is that in the work that we are trying to do in this arena, we're trying to keep the environmental bar as level as possible between where we would have been if a bill like 517 was not adopted versus where we may be heading if that bill and its attendant consequences come to pass. From a logical standpoint, it would seem to me that rather than mandate the inputs into the engine chamber that are combusted. You can, in turn, mandate the exhaust coming out of the tailpipe, including the volatile organic compounds, and let uh, yes. the science but there is cook. one. But there is one small problem. All it's right. called models, and they are not perfect. They are no, not perfect by any means. They're useful. Some of them are very good in terms of certifying fuels and providing directional guidance. But ultimately, what we need to protect is ambient air quality levels. And, and, and by the time we get that correlation of fuel quality all the way out to ambient air quality in San Joaquin Valley or in New York City or anywhere else, then we have made a certain number of jumps in that process, which makes science become less stable than you would have expected or assumed in your statement. Do we not have those problems obtaining or attaining ambient air quality regardless? We do. However, we have a demonstrated record of success with the current reformulated gasoline program, which most stakeholders, if not all, uh, will rapidly step forward and say that from an air quality standpoint, the program has done its work. It's done That's a yeoman's six to job. $8 billion a year <laughs> transfer. My time. No, I'm I'm talking sorry. about the existing RFG program now. My time's expired. Mr. Tierney. Thank you. I, I can't stay long, much longer, but I do want to ask Mr. Early some questions here. Uh, what did the Blue Ribbon Commission uh, recommend with respect to MTBE? They, they recommended um, a, a phase down, and most members rec recommended a phase out of MTBE. Um, it's, I mean, the thing that's important to focus on is that MTBE has uh, and the concern that the public has about MTBE has eroded the public support for clean fuels programs, for reformulated gasoline program. And part of the reason the Lung Association is here today is we need to make changes in order to increase public support for reformulated gasoline because this is a program, as Mr. Economides just uh, said, that has a proven record of, of, um, of effectiveness in reducing smog. And we would like to see more communities um, adopting RFG rather than going to a boutique fuel alternative. Uh, what did the Blue Ribbon Commission uh, recommend with respect to ethanol? The, the, the uh, commission acknowledged the fact that um, uh, there are other reasons for using ethanol and bas basically punted the, the question of whether ethanol should be required to Congress. Couldn't we have one national standard if we really desired to have one? Well, um, 
we could have a national standard there's no question but i'm sure that the other gentleman at this table would observe that if that standard were as effective at reducing air pollution as the lung association would like to see we would shrink our gasoline supply even further and even the lung association stop using as much of it i'm sorry unless of course we stop using yeah well of course that's a but, and, and you can certainly make an argument in, in areas where you don't have large population concentrations, um, you don't have to use the cleanest gasoline that's available because you don't have an air pollution problem. Uh, we ought to be targeting our resources in the places where the problems are, which is essentially what the Clean Air Act has attempted to do. Um, How do you get away from the boutique fuel problem? Uh, I mean, I read studies that tell me that, you know, the industry is sort of uh, trying to encourage the states to get into as many boutique uh, situations as they can. Others disclaim that. Uh, how do we do what you're saying and have the flexibility? One of the most important things you can do is get rid of, the, of, of MTBE in all gasoline. I mean, as an example of how powerful an issue this is, the state of Texas adopted a boutique fuel for the entire eastern half of the state that prohibited refiners from increasing MTBE levels in the fuel above the levels that were b being used at the time of adoption. So MTBE isn't even popular in Texas, let alone anywhere else. So um, it, it, gives you a, uh, it, it, it gives you an idea of how powerful an issue this is and why we need to get rid of MTBE as a starter. And then areas will, I, I think, look to reformulated gasoline. Um, th the other thing you can do is sort of change some of the other provisions um, to make RFG more uniform. And we think that the changes in S-517 move in that direction um, and will result in a more uniform reformulated gasoline across the country and help relieve some of the price spikes. For instance, I don't think in the future, if you adopted the provisions that are, are in Senator Daschle's bill, that you would see the price spikes that occurred in the Chicago-Milwaukee reformulated gasoline market that they experienced last summer and the summer before, because there'll be a larger overall national pool of fuel that can be sent to that area in case of an artificial sh shortage. Thank you. I'm going to yield back the, the balance of my time because I have to go, but I want to thank the panel for the testimony, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Tierney's question is uh, sp spurred uh, one on mine, and I think, Dr. Rouser, you talked about this in your written testimony. In a comparative sense, the air quality improvements that are achievable using ethanol at an eight, excuse me, a nine, eight and a half to ten cent a gallon increase in price, are they all attributable? Are they are those air quality improvements attributable to the ethanol? additive or are they attributable to the price increase that causes a reduction in use of fuels? They're certainly attributable to the latter. That is to say, with ethanol, the price goes up. There is some response on the demand side. There is a diminution in demand, and with that comes a lower air quality uh, effect or an improved uh, effect in terms of the reduction of air toxics. So uh, that's, before, that's one effect, but, th but this, there is a second effect, too. Before I lose my train of thought. Okay, okay. Uh, so ethanol creates a benefit of X. Yes. How high would the, what would have to be the incremental increase in price alone to achieve the same air quality impact that ethanol achieves? With regard to just this component of the increase, or ge generically? Generically. Generically. My, I mean, my, if you're going to tell me eight and a half to ten cents a gallon, I'm going to say, why are we adding ethanol? So that, I mean, that's my question. How much, in terms of a price increase, to achieve the same benefit we get from having ethanol as the oxygen? How much of a price increase do we have to get? Well, th that would depend on lots of other factors that I don't believe I have a precise answer for you. Can I submit that to you in writing? Yes, and I can right. get an answer for you, but that's not something that we've asked the model to answer, but we could. Uh, it would be um, to get the same effects. Are you suggesting through an alternative mechanism like taxing, 
tax the gasoline price that would lower the demand and you would get then as a result of reduced driving if i understood your testimony here a minute and a half ago was that you raise the price to reduce the amount of gasoline being used you achieve air quality improvements because you have less hydrocarbons being combusted that is correct all right now compare that without ethanol to the case with ethanol how much of a price increase do you have to have to achieve the same air quality benefits solely from a price increase just that portion of the benefits yes. not not the the rest of the air toxic ethanol. reductions right that's the question yes. i'm going to put to yes. you in writing now yes. i want to go back to your second point and, and, and while you're doing that analysis remember to take into account the fact that you use more gallons of ethanol containing yes. gasoline to travel the same number of miles i've got that in the model namely the reduced efficiency uh, the vehicle fuel efficiency you'd yes. also have an improvement in hydrocarbon emission on cold start issues Yes. So the, the second component is the differential between ethanol versus MTBE versus conventional gasoline. Uh, and as I indicated in my testimony, the differential between ethanol and MTBE is only with regard to some particular toxics. Formaldehyde, for example, increases with MTBE. Uh, as said, the aldehyde increases with regard to ethanol, and that results in a differential, too, with regard to the ultimate monetization of the air quality benefits of each of these two different blends. Mr. Kahnemides? I'm, I'm trying to get into this discussion because the Welcome. pollutant that we're talking about, uh, be comparing these two compounds, has a very, very significant impact. If we're talking about organics, hydrocarbons, volatile organics, or VOCs, I don't think I would even go so far as to say that ethanol use in summertime gasoline has any benefit whatsoever. If we go now in turn to nitri uh, nitrogen oxides, NOx kind of compounds, I think both compounds are in essentially wash versus non-oxygenated gasoline mm -hmm. until we get to about 2 percent oxygen content. But ethanol does have a big downside on the NOx side. When you start increasing ethanol towards the maximum of 10 percent, you're looking at substantially inc increased NOx emissions. In fact, some of those were serving as the basis for California's application on a waiver. Uh, the, the doctor's assessment on the toxic side is on point. However, again, even there, you get more dilution when you're adding 11 percent of MTBE versus a 6 percent uh, for ethanol. So you have you have a differential toxic impact as well as the difference mm -hmm. between more acetaldehyde versus formaldehyde being emitted by the two. So all in all, I think from an environmental standpoint, you're looking at a rather imbalanced picture here between what one is doing versus the other. Adding that much ethanol to gasoline, frankly, uh, in a simplified, condensed way means higher gasoline prices for at best equivalent air and most likely dirtier air unless we take the right precautions. Now, this information on MTBE and its implica the implications of its use, or ethanol and the implications of its use, I mean, this, this, we're not talking about new science here. I don't believe it is. So it's been in the public domain for a number of years. For instance, the impacts of MTBE probably have been known for at least four or five years. The uh, situation with ethanol, and the consequence of adding it to fuel have been known for a number of years, the pros and the cons. Am I accurate in that? Well, there's still a lot of argument about the, yes, the, there, the there, pros and the cons. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you had an ethanol industry representative here, they would claim greater air quality benefits than have been described by this panel. But um, um, generally speaking, you're, you're correct. I mean, the, the bottom line is we've learned a lot uh, since the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments required certain components in reformulated gasoline. And what we've learned does all point in the direction that you, Mr. Chairman, have already mentioned, which is the best approach is to mandate the outcome of reformulated gasoline and not how you get to the outcome. Um, I think there's a much broader consensus that that's an approach to take uh, than, there, than there was in 1990 when these provisions were adopted. Um, I would only make one observation as part of this discussion, which is that when um, EPA evaluated 
California's waiver request for the oxygen requirement, they determined that even if they had granted the oxygen waiver so that reformulated gasoline could be sold in California and not meet the 2% oxygen requirement, 60% of the reformulated gasoline in sold in California would contain ethanol mostly to provide octane. So it, 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 I, I raise that only to point out that, that the benefits that, oc that ethanol bring to gasoline formulations don't have to do with air quality. They have to do with other, uh, other elements that, that refiners need also to meet when they're, produ when they're producing gasoline. Mr. Early, uh, some time ago, you were over before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee on the EPA's Renewable Oxygenate Program, which, as near as I can tell from a comparative standpoint, is very similar to Senator Daschle's energy bill. And at that time, the quote that's in front of me is, in sum, we see the Renewable Oxygenate Program as potentially increasing global warming, increasing smog, increasing air toxics, and increasing water pollution and damage to erodible and sensitive habitat areas. All this at an increased cost to the reformulated gasoline consumer and a significant decrease in highway trust fund revenues. I assert that this proposal is fatally flawed. It is time to focus on the main goal of the reformulated program, which is reducing air pollution and stop trying to manipulate it for other purposes, such as increased ethanol demand. Now, the thing that I'm confused about is that you refer to Senator Daschle's fuel provisions today as constructive changes to RFG and conventional gasoline. I guess my question is, do you believe in mandating the use of ethanol in gasoline as good for the environment? I think I hear you saying something very similar to what I'm saying, which is not that you mandate, but that you actually say what your goal is and let people go find a way to it. Mr. Chairman, I've been pretty consistent in my position on this. I, I uh, don't believe that an ethanol mandate is necessary for air quality. Um, and I've never supported an ethanol mandate for air quality. There are other reasons to support an ethanol mandate. Under the circumstances that we're talking with respect to Senator Daschle's bill, one of the most important purposes from my perspective is to garner 60 votes. Now, the, See, the one senators of my, one who, of my the senators is who, to pass legislation that makes good policy, not good politics. The, the senators who represent the the agricultural states would forward other arguments, and I don't have, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm really not in a position to be judgmental on those arguments regarding the benefit that an ethanol mandate provides. California is the to, largest agricultural state to in the to the agricultural economy, to the reduction in oil imports, and to uh, global warming. L let me make one note, which is that recent studies would seem to indicate that because of improvements in ethanol production, it is not a global warming loser. And at the time that I testified, um, the testimony that you've taken, that was not true. There, there have been some improvements in technology so that you can make modest eth uh, global warming um, gains from, from uh, substituting ethanol for gasoline. Okay. But they are, I have to observe, rather modest. All right. Dr. Rouser. Just a clarification. Moving from the current oxygenated requirements and using ethanol as the choice blending ingredient to satisfy those requirements does not reduce oil imports. It increases oil imports. I mean, I think that testimony has already been revealed here. I want to I want to thank this panel for coming today. Uh, this has been highly educational, and I am appreciative of you taking the time to come down. Uh, the facts of the matter are, from where I sit today, it appears that there's a group that got together with somebody in Senator Daschle's office or the senator himself and cooked up something to basically impose on the rest of the country a mandate to use five billion gallons of ethanol over the next number of years at a cost to the American consumer of 6.37 to 8.4 billion dollars a year. That can be good policy or it can be good politics or it might be neither. But the fact of the matter is, 
It's money out of the pockets of Californians. It's money out of the pockets of people up in the Northeast, like those that may live in Mr. Tierney's district. It's money out of the pockets of the people who may live in Mr. Shea's district. And it doesn't have one single thing to do with getting cloture in the Senate. Compromise on bad legislation gives you bad legislation. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your testimony. If we have questions, we will leave the record open for a period of 10 days. Timely responses are appreciated. Again, thank you. We'll see you again. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned. Now a programming update. Next, remarks by President Bush and the King of Morocco 